Uh, welcome everybody to um, this is the first meeting of 2022. Happy New Year. It's uh, January 11th. This is the select board meeting. We've got everybody here um, and hopefully uh, masks are not going to impede our speaking. We're trying to model good behavior here. So um, we will start with oh, I my last month, um, with any public comment. Any questions? I don't see any hands, so we'll just keep going. We have a full agenda tonight. So, there, so there is a hand. I'm sorry. There is a hand. If you'd like me to, uh, Ms. Uh, Doty, I don't know your name, but I see you have a hand up. I did ask her to unmute. I I'm, to I'm Susan Doty at 41 White Pond Road. I reside. Um, and have uh, for about 50 years here in town. Um, I do not feel that there should be an increase in the number of used cars allowed for sale at the lot. Um, I was surprised to see the number that have come to exist now. I spent a great deal of time with a former owner of the property, Wayne Erkinen, and there were not as many cars as there are now. Um, I was under the impression that if uh, it was grandfathered use uh, decreased, it would not increase again. I felt there would be no increases from the amount uh, the past business had. Okay, thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Um, I think, uh, Mark and Dorothy, we've heard enough. I don't think I'm going to call on you just now to see if there's other people who want to speak. Julie? Come on. Yeah. Yes, um, I'm just, I'm an employee of the town and I just wanted to express my, um, I'm against the vaccination, mandatory vaccination policy for the employees. Uh, I don't believe that an employee should be fired because they don't get the vaccination. I believe that's a personal decision that should be made with their own personal health provider. And I have other employees that feel the same way, at least 29 other people. Um, have signed along with me against that vaccination policy. Yeah, if you could pass that list along, that would be helpful, Julie. Thank you. You're welcome. Mark, are you gonna are you speaking about the permit? Am I gonna do you want me to unmute them? I guess. Yeah. I just, if Mark, if I, I need this to be new information, we've heard from you a lot. You've had a lot of airtime. So if you have anything new to say, please do it. Otherwise, we're going to move on. Well, I just want to let you know that there's three zoning issues going on with that Kylot Express right now uh, regarding enforcement. I don't believe there should be any increase in there. I also went back on the minutes from 2017 to 2021. I don't see any uh, any place where the states have 100 cars or more were ever allowed in that lot. It was just always been licensed to the paved area, which the Kyle Lot Express has removed some of it already. So that's the uh, that's basically the, the drift I have for you tonight. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. All right, we're gonna move on. Um, so um, in terms of uh, comments from the board, I just have a couple and then I think some other members might have. Um, just for the board's members uh, knowledge, the planning board is gonna join us at our next meeting to talk oh, some about the um, mostly around the spring town meeting warrant. Um, so um, we haven't figured, it's not a night they meet actually, it's their one night off <laughs> next month but, or this month. But um, so if you have specific questions um, for them, you can either send them to me or, or send them directly to Lori and we'll, we'll have that conversation. We'll, we're planning for a half an hour. So um, I want to let people know the police department as, as having their Citizens Academy starts in the beginning of February and they still have some openings if you're interested. Um, there's there's information on the town website. And um, Zach, did you have something about NASDAQ? 
Yeah, so, so the Neshoba Area Social Justice Alliance is hosting a MLK weekend day of service events uh, for three days on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. They're looking for people to donate items, donate money, donate their time. Um, on donating items, uh, and Stowe will be at the Randall Library, the FPC parking lot. Um, and on Saturday's donations will go to Wheat. Uh, Sunday's donations will go to the Stowe Food Pantry, and on Monday's donations will go to Open Table. Uh, they've created a flyer and have uh, information on social media that they put out there. Uh, some other wish lists are sort of any and all, you know, non-perishable items and personal hygiene items for both uh, men, women, and children, as well as uh, the Stowe Food Pantry. It has a wish list of Ritz crackers, wheat thins, triscuits, cereal, and flavored oatmeal packets. So mm -hmm. if you have any extra and wish to give, uh, please do so uh, on Saturday or Sunday, excuse me, for the Stowe Food Pantry. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Nasha, for doing that. That's great. Um, anything else? Any other um, announcements? I, I wanted to recognition. Um, okay. So um, on the on a sad note, we've had a, several deaths in the community over the last, really over the holidays, um, and particularly a few that were um, really tough on our first responders. Um, I'm grateful for our town administrator brought in uh, grief counseling for them. So I just want people to know that um, you know, our our public safety team is working hard, um, regardless of the holiday, regardless of the calendars, and we should be uh, grateful that for them and also understand how difficult their work can be. Um, we did want to mention one particular um, young person who passed, and Jim, you want to mention that? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted the board to mark the passing of uh, Katie Donovan, a 26-year-old daughter of uh, Kristen and Mark Donovan. Uh, Kristen was for a long time on the COA board and very active in town and she would bring Katie to many meetings and many of us got to know her and see her there um, in her own right. She was an accomplished artist and animal lover um, and uh, she will be missed and our sympathies go out to the front of the family. Um, on a happier note, um, we get to uh, we have a new uh, Eagle Scout that's going to be sworn in uh, this weekend. Um, at the Old Town Hall, and uh, we have a certificate um, for him. And do we want to read the the um? Well, I'll read the letter. So this is it's for Jude Porter, who lives up on Lowell Drive. Um, the select board of the town of Mass uh, town of Stowe <laughs> congratulates you on achieving the rank of Eagle Scout, the highest rank of the Boy Scouts of America. As an exemplary scout who has performed a number of services for his community, the board would like to acknowledge your accomplishments and express its best wishes for your continued success and involvement with the community. Achieving Eagle Scout status is an accomplishment of which you can be extremely proud. The board is confident that your experience as a Boy Scout will serve you well in your future endeavors. And I just want to add that, you know, our fire chief, who we just uh, recently named, um, is head of the Boy Scout Troop of Troop One, which um, is, is a proud part of the Stowe Committee. And um, I remember when, uh, JP was saying at his swearing in how community services is core to what he does and everything he's done. And um, he's done a really incredible job with these Eagle Scouts. So uh, mm -hmm. congratulations, Jude and his family. And we will have a certificate that we'll be presenting on Sunday. If you would like to entertain a motion to approve that certificate, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> that would be a great thing. Um, um, Madam Chair, yes, I please. move to recognize Boy Scout Jude Porter for achieving the rank of Eagle, of Eagle Scout and to sign the letter and proclamation to be presented at his recognition ceremony on Sunday, January 16th, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Again, congratulations. Um, any other recognitions that I missed? Okay. Um, so now we have a number of appointments. Um, first to the highway department, Ben Kilson to the position of highway truck driver and laborer. Um, I understand our town administrator has approved of the recommendation of the highway department. Um, any questions? And I assume we, Steve is probably not on, is he? Steve is, but, oh, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, I can speak to it. Um, he actually applied, uh, he was interviewed last Tuesday and we put him on temporarily beginning Wednesday because we were so short staffed leading into the snowstorm that he was eager and willing to work on a temporary basis pending his 
uh, pre-employment pre physical and drug screen, which we are hopeful will uh, we will get the results this week. Um, so he's very enthusiastic, um, has a very impressive background, mainly in grounds maintenance, which will be a huge help for us here. Um, and he is very excited about the opportunity. So I think he'll be great. So I ask that your appointment be contingent on receiving the results of his pre-employment testing. Great. I will take background check and everything else was perfect. Okay. Oh, great. great. Madam Chair, I move to appoint Benjamin Kelson to the position of truck driver laborer for the Stowe Highway Department, pending a successful pre-employment physical and drug test. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Let's see, unanimous. Great. Thank you, Ben, and welcome to Stowe. Um, so now we have a few boards, uh, volunteers. Um, the first is for the Zoning Board of Appeals, Andy DeMora, and I don't have he is. I just asked him to unmute. All right. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Andy. Good so, um, thank you for stepping up. Uh, would you like to speak to why you want to be on the ZBA? Well, I've been doing it for a while, and I think I've made a uh, contribution on large and small projects, and I've got some experience, and I'd like to continue. So, I'm interested in following up and continuing that service. Love to hear that. Thank you for, uh, for and you serving as an associate and for those who don't know, and um, we're, we're grateful that you, that didn't scare you away and that you're willing to become a full member. So <laughs> well, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Kumar? I do just want to point out that he has been an associate since 2009. Oh, um, so he has been with the ZBA for quite <laughs> some time and I'm thrilled that he wanted to step up into the full-time role. That's great. That is great. And I will Me be too. <laughs> <laughs> I move to appoint Andrew DeMore as a full-time member of the Zoning Board of Appeals to fulfill the remainder of a five-year term expiring June 30th, 2026. Second. All in favor? All right. All right. That is unanimous. All right. Thank you again and best wishes. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Look forward to it. And uh, given that that leaves a, a, a vacancy in the associate, we have a, a volunteer um, interested in stepping into the associate role. Um, Andrew Cosby, is he also? Yes, he is. Great. Hey, I'm here. Hi, Andrew. Um, so you? You, uh, can you also share with us, you know, what, what brings you to the ZBA? Well, um, I was looking for, you know, another thing to do for town. Um, I've, I've enjoyed the pro, uh, activities I've been with with the commission, the historical commission, and the town hall restoration committee, as well as uh, uh, CPC. And I wanted to learn a different aspect of the of the town governance, and this looked very interesting to me. So I decided to start attending meetings and found it fascinating. I'd like to continue doing that. That's great, right? That's terrific. Uh, any questions? Yes. I just want to say I've, I've dealt with Andy on a few occasions, thoughtful and deliberative, and I think more Andy Crosby is always a good thing. So, <laughs> thank you. Here, here. Absolutely. <laughs> you got a fan club here. All right. I will uh, take a motion. I move to appoint Andrew Crosby as an associate member of the Zoning Board of Appeals to fulfill the remainder of a five year term expiring June 30th, 2025. Second. All in favor? Uh, All right. Unanimous. Great. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, next appointment is to the Council on Aging. And I know uh, Jean General is not able to join us. She's traveling today. I happen to have known Jean most of my life here in Stowe. So, um, uh, and I, she's been serving as an associate member since the spring and was interested in stepping up to a full seat on the Council on Aging. Um, Denise, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, just that I think she'll be a valuable member. She's contributed greatly in the short time that she has been an associate member. So I think she'll fit in very well and continue to make positive contributions. Yeah. And uh, Jean has was on a lot of boards around the schools for a long, many, many years. And so it, she took a few years off, but now she's retired and decided it was time to step up. So I'm um, Glad that she's joining and Courtney also got motion, please. I move to appoint Jean Genero to the Council on Aging for an indefinite term. Second. Does she know that? <laughs> <laughs> See what we do when you're not at the meeting, right? There you go. 
Okay. Did so you say second? Yeah. Second. Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you, Jean. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> like, so that's great. May, and may I interrupt before you go on? Yes. If Susan, if you're on the meeting, can you raise your hand so I know who to unmute? Oh, are you a Zoom user? I think I can see him there. Great. Thank you. So Susan, thank you for stepping up. I know you've done your own share of other boards as well. Uh, can, can you tell us one thing I learned that this is one fund, the Randall Relief Town Fund and Farm, Town Farm Fund? Uh, <laughs> we're not giving you three different committee assignments all at once? I know. Well, if you Google it, I didn't find any information. So it's... <laughs> I had to check with Linda Hathaway. I had to check with Louise Peacock. <laughs> you know, I didn't find it on it. So I tried to do my homework. <laughs> well, that's your first assignment is to tell us more about it. So, you know. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you what I learned today from Louise. And I think she's on too. Um, the way she explained it to me that this money was all donated and put into a trust many years ago by the Randall family. And the mission of the trust was to support farmers who had no health insurance and had other financial difficulties. And so this now has been carried through the years. So I'm grateful that Louise, you know, she's the one that invited me to join them, Jeff, she and Jeff Smith. And Dorothy Songenson was having a hard time retiring unless she knew the person that was going to take her place. And she wrote me a nice letter and asked me if I would consider doing this. And I would. So then when I started to research it, it was just comical. The whole thing was comical. <laughs> I didn't know all the steps to take, but it was really fun and interesting. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward. And Louise and I have worked together for 11 years now. As some of you know, down at the Council of Aging, I volunteered there for 11 years for the Stowe Friends in the capacity of their gift shop manager for eight years, teaching in the craft class for eight years, and organizing their annual craft fair and recruiting others to volunteer in the community and support the Stowe Friends in their fundraising efforts. So, so that's where I'm coming from, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much for stepping up. I appreciate it. And for all you've yep. done for the COA. The COA oh, is you. quite the, the gift shop now. I did a lot of Christmas shopping there this year. <laughs> thank you. I know. <laughs> thank you. Um, Courtney, do you want to, or uh, Denise, do you have anything else to add? Nope. I just think she'll be fantastic in this role, um, in whatever that role is. <laughs> <laughs> I think she'll be fantastic. <laughs> we'll not together, Denise. <laughs> That works for me. <laughs> All right. Madam you. Chair, I move to appoint Susan Rondo to the Randall Relief Town Fund and Town Farm Fund for the remainder of a three-year term expiring June 30th, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Great. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, we'll just reappoint oh, okay. when the reappointments come up. All right, Denise, it's on to you and your report. Yes, um, so I will start with the, um, the news of our current COVID cases in town. Uh, the numbers came out for last week. We are up to 93 cases in town, which puts us over 10% positivity rating. Uh, we are at 10.34%. Middlesex County is at 12.55%, and the state overall is at 15.03%. Uh, keep in mind now this does not include home tests so this is just the regular statistics they are planning to make some changes to how they're reporting those numbers so we'll see what comes out when they release next week's numbers um, as has been posted um, the municipal buildings remain closed um, for the time being uh, right now through january 23rd and i will reevaluate um, and see where we stand with the numbers at that point um, employees are very nervous. Um, they're nervous coming in with employees in the building. So um, there's a little hesitation still. We're still a few weeks away, but at the thought of reopening. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that plays out. And as long as we can do so safely, we will. If we need another week or two, we will do that as well. So um, I will continue to post that on our website and let folks know uh, where that would stand. Um, the, you may have read in our local paper, Bolton discussed it at one of their recent meetings. Uh, there's a national opioid settlement <clears throat> that the Mass Attorney General's Office has filed on behalf of the Commonwealth and its subdivisions against pharmaceutical distributors. 
um, to abate the op opioid epidemic, to correct the current opioid marketing, sale, and distribution practices. Um, municipalities can directly share in the settlements approximately $22.7 billion if they individually register as part of the settlement. So I have done that on behalf of the town. We just needed to fill out a form and send it in and say that we were joining the suit along with the state. There is no cost to participate in the settlement and any funds that we do receive will be earmarked specifically for remediation and, and abating the impacts of the opioid crisis in town. So we'll be working with that with police and fire and possibly um, the mental health professionals that we have working with us to figure out how best to address that and use those funds accordingly when and if they come down. Um, the, um, the other matter I have is um, we have a, a police grievance that's come to the town and it has been escalated up to a step three, which means the select board. The police contract calls for the select board or their designee um, to hear the grievance and then provide a response. Uh, we will need to schedule a hearing within the next week and then render a decision seven working days after that. Um, I would respectfully ask the board to assign two members as their designee. Um, if we have a quorum, it does rise to an executive session, but still it's, you know, it's, it's personnel matters and it could be a very sensitive topic. So I'd like to ask if the board would be willing to designate a couple of members to hear the grievance and render a decision on behalf of the board. So I was thinking <clears throat> maybe one of our lawyers might be available, maybe two of them, <laughs> just as people who might, uh, maybe someone who is particularly more familiar with the uh, contracts and tech. Yeah. I'd be happy to. Are you? Well, I mean, that. it's a tough timeline, so I don't. I mean, I know both of you. Does that work? work? We can make it work. I can. Yeah, I work. So that time. I would feel I much more comfortable be easier with that. For me yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That'd be awesome. Yeah. All right. So we will. Okay. So I will. Yes. Yeah, so I will work with you to set up some Perfect. dates. Um, we can certainly use this room to coordinate a hearing with our council. Um, I'll provide you all the relevant documentation. It is a lot. There's been a lot going back and forth, but you'll have a chance to read it and digest it all before you hear the facts. So that would be wonderful. Should that be in the form of a motion? Yeah, I was going to say, should we? Sure. Yeah. So <laughs> can I can I make motions? You can. I can. Right. It's bad form. It's bad form <laughs> for chairs to make motions. All right. <laughs> then I'm putting it on to you. So oh, come on. Uh, come um, on. I, <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to designate Zach Burns and Jim Salvi as the select board designees for the grievance case. The step three. The step three police <laughs> grievance case. Second. Any any questions? Any comments? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Great. Thank, Thank you both again. I sure. appreciate that. Um, I think that's all I have for right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think there's been a lot going around, but I was trying to limit what I had tonight because of other stuff that we have on the agenda. So I will leave it at that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Next is the discussion for dates for annual town meeting, town election, and to open the warrant for the 2022 annual town meeting. Um, where do we want to start on this? Um, so I, I think we can certainly start with town meeting. Um, so we are recommending, uh, we briefly talked about it last meeting, Saturday, May 14th. Um, I, I just picked 9 a.m. I think we started at 9 a.m. last year for the annual and got out around 1. So I think that probably uh, makes the most sense. Um, <clears throat> I would ask that the board as part of, it's all part of the same motion, let me see. Yep, so I would ask that the board, um, I guess they're separate, um, we open the warrant today and begin taking articles and we close the warrant on Friday, April 1st. That will give us time to do the necessary steps prior to town meeting. Um, and working with Linda and the town clerk's office, we discussed the town election being the following Saturday, May 21st, with the polls being open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and if you'd like, I can read the um, races that are open. Sure. Sure. Um, so we have the moderator for uh, one moderator for a three-year term, two select board members for three-year terms, 
one board of assessors for three-year term, one board of health member for three-year term, one Neshova Regional School District Committee member for three-year term, <clears throat> one Stowe Housing Authority member for an unexpired five-year term expiring 2024, one Stowe Housing Authority member for an unexpired term, five-year term expiring 2026, three Randall Library trustees for three-year terms, and one planning board member for a five-year term. Lots of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Nomination papers will be available, uh, I believe, right away. They were working on getting them ready. So once you formally announced it, they would have the nomination papers. And I know that Linda had reached out to or is planning to reach out to those who are up for re-election uh, to let them know the timeline as well. Um, one question I had, which I, it's not what we have to decide tonight, but in, in the past, Spring Fest has been on the Saturday after the election, which was on a weekday. Um, we haven't had one for several years at this point, partly COVID and I think partly lack of a committee. Um, do you know, has anybody been talking about it? So, yeah. No one has reached out. No one's talked about it. There's been no communication right. um, regarding Spring Fest, to my knowledge, thus far. There was a revitalized committee. Yeah, like right before, I mean, right before I volunteered for it a lot before yes. COVID. I want to like, say, I want to say 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. And they did a nice job yeah, with yeah. the last Spring Fest that I remember. Yeah. Um, surely their names are somewhere in our files. <laughs> <laughs> we only have um, two official members right now, so there's not enough really? people to call the a committee. They they can't they don't have a quorum. So oh. I know the people who do that. And it would be, I mean it's it's short notice now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's a lot to plan it. Yeah. I remember the year we tried to do that on short notice. It's makes some people crazy. So uh, I think it's hard with COVID. Yeah. Right. You know, I think that's like, I think this might not be the, this year, might not be the year to bring right. it back. But. Right. So, okay. Well, maybe we can come up with oh, one thing to do a concert that night or something. Know, picnic or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. If anyone's interested, they're free to contact me directly. <laughs> <I'll> do <laughs> <it>. no. <laughs> um, okay. So we should vote on, is there any questions about the, um, the dates or the, or the warrant? No. Nope. So um, let's do the, I guess, two motions first on the warrant and then on the the town meeting and election i would say so we're, we're three let's figure from it's listed as two separate ones so we, well i'll start with moving that the board open the 2022 annual town meeting warrant on tuesday january 11th 2022 and close the warrant on friday april 1st 2022. second all in favor Aye. Um, and I move that the annual town meeting be held on Saturday, May 14th, 2022 at Center School. For oh, I'm sorry, I may interrupt you. That should be Hale School. At oh, Hale right. School, which has a different address. It's Hartley Road. Hartley Hartley Road. Road. Yeah. Right. Um, I move that the annual town meeting be held on Saturday, May 14th, 2022 at Hale School, Hartley Road, starting at 9 a.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. I move that the annual town election be held on Saturday, May 21st, 2022 at Center School, 403 Great Road, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Second. Do you need to read the... Do we need the positions here yeah, we don't know okay. okay. um all in favor aye. 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 Yes. okay great so we got that all squared away must be time for the police policies hey chief good evening good evening got, got a couple more for us i i do i do um i guess Start with the use of force policy. Everybody, is that okay? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all we got it. It's pretty long. We read it. Um, it, it it is it is long, and um, you know, as I stated in my letter, that back on October first, the um, post our standards and, and training commission uh, put out finally put out their CMR that governs uh, on how we act on our use of force. So I wanted to um, make sure that we were in compliance with that. 
Also, I was told that uh, by post that even though this has come out, there probably be more changes later on. Um, it's a ever working document. So as they come up, I probably be in front of you again for more use of force changes. Uh, I know this is the third time I've been in front of this board for uh, use of force changes, but I think what they've accomplished and what we've added to it is a um, is going to make us a, a better department. Uh, the one thing that I would like to mention is that in this that is not in the CMR that I did put in our policy uh, and to make it more um, uh, available for our uh, officers that are pregnant who don't want to take a live fire exercise with our firearm is to exempt them from uh, one one uh, training session uh, with their live weapon uh, and that way to reduce any unwanted risk that they wanted to take. However, training would continue. Uh, we have other means that we can do uh, that we can continue training, but this will give the option of those uh, officers who don't want to, who are pregnant, who don't want to uh, expose themselves to the lead, uh, that option and give the chief the option to uh, excuse them from one training session. So I think that's important to mention because um, we still want to, you know, we're a department, we're a family, and we want uh, those who want to uh, extend their own family to feel safe and to uh, have that availability. So uh, I just wanted to make sure I, uh, that was mentioned. Great, thank okay, you. Any questions? I just appreciate that you highlighted the changes because yes. otherwise I don't think we know it that well to know what, what you would change. So I appreciate that. Yeah, you're um, any questions for the chief? I just wanted to add thank you for um, adding this carve out to the policy because I think that's what makes Stowe amazing is that we are thinking beyond uh, the post and we're doing what we should be doing in our town to make sure that it matches the values of our town. So I am I was really excited to read that, but that's part of your decision making and, and just wanted to say thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so with that, I will, should we um, vote on that first? Or okay. do that one? Sure. I move to approve the updated police department use of force policy as presented by police chief Michael Salisi. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So moving on to the next one. Um, so I've seen some other departments come out with our uh, the deaf or hard of hearing for, uh, policy. I looked at ours. It was a little bit outdated. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that our officers uh, knew what resources were out there for them. I also wanted to make sure that anyone that we came in contact um, uh, felt that they were you know, res treated respectfully, uh, and that all the rights that someone who has hearing um, would also um, be be awarded to those who who are hard of hearing. So, again, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was treated uh, respectfully and um, equally. So, I, I updated the policy. Uh, I put all the current um, phone numbers and resources that we use. It's important for our officers to actually use those uh, resources that are legally recognized too. So we, if we do have a case involving somebody, that th that case won't go um, south. So we can make sure that the uh, you know individuals are held accountable for, or that we are providing the rights to all individuals, even the defendants, everybody has uh, the same rights. So we wanna make sure all those rights are adhered to. So that's why I'm putting forward the, uh, this. It's, it's really an updated policy that was already uh, existing, but it has more guidance in there that uh, the other one didn't have. So I had a question, um, having, I used to live with deaf interpreters. If we had interpreters in town um, that would be interested in being a resource, would they have to go through the, the MC DHH first in order to then say to you they're, they're local? So if we were using them for, let's say, an interrogation kind, kind of, uh, and, and make sure that all their rights are adhered to. So if I gave someone their Miranda rights, I would want to make sure that that person who gave them the Miranda rights actually gave them the correct rights and that uh, they and that was uh, relayed to them properly. So I would have them go through uh, that training or get certified by the state. However, if we, you know, emergency situations or trying to get a story from somebody, or we can definitely use a family member if we need to, um, or somebody in town that we need to, if it's uh, that, that we want to be able to quickly relay uh, information back and forth to, because not everybody can uh, read lips, not everybody can read and write. So we, uh, we have to take that into consideration. We have to really look at what that individual we're, we're communicating with 
with the how they feel uh, more most comfortable communicating with us. And my other question was with this mask thing. I know a lot of people who are hard of hearing. This has been a problem since they tend to lip read. Um, do you have equipment in the department that is like the um, I can't remember what they're called anymore. Face, 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 face shields. Yeah, so we do have some face shields. However, you know, if we know somebody is uh, hard of hearing and we, we will pull down uh, our mask. I know uh, for me, uh, knowing a lot of residents in town, I, I can recognize them fairly quickly and I will pull my mask down. Um, so they can, and I know that they do lip read, but um, if someone wants us to do that, we could we can make accommodations, absolutely, uh, whatever they feel comfortable with. And, and again, typing, texting, if they're comfortable with that, if they're not, uh, whatever we need to do to make, uh, to make the communication happen. And again, it's really gonna be driven on the person that we're uh, to, uh, communicating with, because I'm not gonna make any assumptions that how, um, what I think that they, how, or how they, I think that they communicate. So it's really gonna be driven by them. Great, thank you. Other questions? Okay. That's great. Thank you. All right. Uh, policy, please, for All our right. motion. I move to approve the updated police department death or hard of hearing individuals policy as presented by Chief Police Chief Michael Felici. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thanks, Thank you Chief. very much. Thank you. Um, so next is a, um, a request from uh, Carlotta Express for um, amendment to his permit. See Alex there and, and you are unmuted. Yeah, good evening board. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so, for having uh, me. I'll just say right up front, you're, it's looking great over there. It's been a great improvement from the past. So thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks for noticing us. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've been busy. Oh yeah, it's been a busy season. Yeah, I hope uh, we won't have that much snow. So that helps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Knock on wood, right? So your request is to go up to 80 vehicles total. Uh, is that right? 80 vehicles uh, on a lot, yeah. Uh, inside, we don't keep cars. It's basically just maybe we'll put like one, two cars inside, but basically I'm more concerned about outside usage of the lot. That's pretty big lot and we just want to use it cost efficiently, that's all. Um, Denise, did you have any thoughts on this? So we, right now, when we approved it the first time, it was five inside, five in the garage and 60 outside. Correct. So if we said 80 now, is that still leaving five and five in the other? It, it depends how you want to do it. Okay. You could say 80 total, you could say, 80 outside and allow the five and five where you could, it really depends on how you want to move forward. Well, we would like to have 80 outside. Inside, we basically don't keep, right now, It's there's no cars inside. It's just a showroom and, you know, the kind of like meeting area for people that's all. Maybe we'll put one nice car if we if I happen to have some nice car to put in, but I don't need many vehicles inside. There's, not that much space, so it's not a concern. It's basically, uh, the 80 vehicles, that's what we wanna use on the lot outside. Um, thoughts from the board? I mean, it seems like we don't wanna, if you're not using the spaces inside, I, no. I'd be more comfortable reducing those numbers. Yeah, um, that's no problem. And maybe like, you know, leave two cars inside, that's maximum that it can fit here, yeah. Does that team, would people be comfortable with that? Yeah, so, Alex, how about the garage? Do you do you use that to some degree? Well, I'm just talking about like a display vehicle, vehicles for sale, garage, yeah. Well, the garage would fit for like five cars, yeah. That's, there will be no changes out there, yeah, in a garage. Oh, I see. So I think we had a 60, outside five inside in the showroom and five in the garage so if you want to reuse the amount of cars uh in the showroom i mean one two cars that's plenty for us uh, so basically we would like to have 80 outside uh five in the garage and if you want to reduce to 
two vehicles in a showroom, that's fine too. Okay, Mr. Selby. Yeah. So a question for the board or the town administrator and mm -hmm. then uh, a comment. Um, 80 would still be less than what was there when it was infinite, right? We're, we're using about 100 as the assumption for what it was when it was infinite. Okay. I mean, my recollection, although it seems like years ago, which is that when we first spoke about this, we said, well, <coughs> try 60, see how it's going. We'll see how it goes. We'll see, we'll see what it looks like, see if there's any problems with the police or anything else. Um, and then we'll be open to an increase. Um, I have not heard of any problems. The police chief was just here. I'm kind of assuming he would have let us know about something. Um, so I'm certainly, before hearing any public comment, if there is going to be some, I am certainly right now inclined to go along with this. Um, I like the idea of sort of netting it. If he's not using all the spots inside, netting at least a few of them out. Um, he has, it, it, it looks nice. Um, it, it just looks more orderly. Uh, Cars I might actually be interested in buying. That's a purely subjective comment. Um, you know, it's just, it, it looks good. It's nice to see inventory on the lot, I right. think, too. I think it's the visual. So, I didn't need the um, chief. If, if you want, I can give like a quick. Um, There's just basically <laughs> the show. Uh, Want to come, you know, stop by, take a look, but it's like not that much space, anyways. And maybe we'll put one car or in this area here just for the you know just as a display and make it look attractive that's all but um we, we don't store cars inside that's all so it's not that much that we need for inside it's not just to use on a lot outside um right now it's probably half of the lot's empty and i'm about probably 55 cars uh so maybe you know Half of the lot would fit probably more than that, but uh, I think 80 cars would be more than enough for now for our capabilities. Um, Chief, if, if you are there, have you you have any concerns at all? Uh, so, the, Mr. Salvi, the, the only complaints that we've been getting or concerns that we've been getting are the ones you've already heard from other residents uh, that directly speak to the board. Um, as far as the police department goes, no, we have... Uh, we haven't got anything further that would uh, provide concern for me. I agree with the comments that are made, you know, about the what the property looks like now compared to what it did. So uh, I'm, I don't have any concerns about the increase. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate the business-like approach and the and the order mm -hmm. that's there. Mm -hmm. It just looks intentional and nice, mm -hmm. and and like I would go there if I needed a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Feel free to give us a call. <laughs> I just wanted to ask uh, Denise, uh, what standard should we be using in this uh, increased request? It's up to the board. Complete discretion up to the board. Because I think what's important is that in the past, is, as Jim alluded to, there was no limit, right? There was really no number used. And so when we talked about 100 the last time, it was sort of as a can you fit through that? that, through that, that was the okay. issue, right? So, um, so I'm I'm perfectly happy with this. Basically, 87 would be 80 outside, two in the showroom, and five in the garage. Well, actually, if, that, I, if I can add, um, so yeah. when the cars are in the garage, they really shouldn't be up for sale. Um, he can have cars in the garage that don't have are not technically for sale. I think. Oh, they're um, not for sale. Yeah, they they still in process. Yeah, they're not for sale. You gave him 80 cars overall. If he wanted to put one in the showroom, wanted to put one, I think that would allow him to put all 80 outside if he wanted. And then that will only really increase 10 cars from what he currently has, but allow the flexibility to put all 80 outside. Does that work for you, Alex? Um, well, if we can say 85 total, including all the areas without like, I mean, for me, it's just easy to have one number without Kevin, oh, I can't put another car here, or it's now five cars limit in a garage, you know. So for me, it's easy just to have one number for, for the whole operation. So if we can say like 85, that's that's plenty for now, yeah. Let's keep it at 80. But I like I agree with the one number concept. Because I'm like, it's an just, opportunity to be able to have some wiggle room in the garage and in the showroom and, and whatnot. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if the cars in a garage won't count, 
uh, then it's no problem. 80 total for the, like, you know, the lot and a few cars in the showroom. Yeah, if the garage doesn't count, as you said, those are not for sale anyway, so they won't count. Yeah. I mean, we're not trying to stick the car in every single spot here and, you know, oh, okay, and now if they give me five spots, so I'll put it here. This is just for, you know, have some flexibility and be able to cost efficiently, you know, use the lot and all the premises. That That's all. So I won't be like kind of limited and tied it up. Okay. So we've got 80. It's 80. Be total. Any cars that are inside are not for sale, so don't count. Well, other than the showroom. If, the, the showroom. if he puts the cars in the showroom, room. they would be for sale. Right. right. And the... 80 applies to cars in the showroom and outside. All right. Yeah. Thank you. That should be fine. All right. I appreciate your time. All right. So I, we, I, I do have so, one. Oh, yeah. You have another question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I have a suggestion for a condition, but I wasn't. Okay. So, um, in, in, we got some written comments mm -hmm. on this. And a lot of the comment, well, a lot of the comment had to do with litigation that is currently pending, which I'm not really paying attention to because it's litigation is currently pending. Mm -hmm. But some of it had to do with Board of Health issues. Mm -hmm. And I got curious about it. I asked the town administrator whether the health agent had been out there. He had. He issued a written report. Um, summarizing that report is he didn't really find anything that bad at all. Um, it is not a public water supply. And I think I understand the reasons why. He had a few conditions though. They struck me as not that big. It doesn't really matter what they are. Um, one had to do with a tight tank for any kind of liquids from the garage or for, from the mechanics area. Um, I would like to add a condition that as a condition of this, the business comply with the instructions given by the health agent as a result of his inspection on November 26th. I think that's a bit redundant because if the health agent issued the orders, the man has to comply with it anyway, but just to show some responsiveness to the public comment, I'd like to add that as a condition of this. Um, so I I don't think that we've seen it. So I'm um, a little, was that in the past? Was it was not because Jim asked me yesterday. Okay. So I will say that the main condition was um, that cars are not able to be washed on site. Uh, commercial vehicles cannot be washed there without having um, a proper drain and, and remove that waste material. So cars would have to be washed off site. That was his main concern. Uh, there was another issue about plumbing, um, but I believe that's been all taken care of. Those were in, in the public water supply he addressed because there's too few people on site. If the, if the use of the lot was to increase, if more businesses, more people or employees were to be there, it would rise to a public water supply, but it is not. So he does not fall under those mandates. So if I, it's a good point. I'm sorry. I just got this today. And I, didn't, okay. mm -hmm. I didn't even think to send it out. Um, the bottom line is in a paragraph at the end of this memo. It's a memo dated December 13th. He recounts his whole visit. Based on the site visit and our walkthrough, the spaces, this is a public document, right? Yep. Yeah. The spaces, the following items need to be addressed. Based on our site and our walkthrough of the spaces, the following items need to be addressed. One, have a plumber inspect the trough, he means in the mechanics bay, in the garage bay to ensure it's not connected to the plumbing. Two, mechanics on site need to obtain a hazardous waste generator's IDs. Three, cease the on site washing of vehicles. Four, please provide a copy of the deactivation paperwork from D from DEP for the PWS public water supply. Uh, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the conditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, he already told Alex about this, presumably. So Alex already has to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we already, I mean, it's some points that he, you know, some issues that he pointed out that have been taken care of. I mean, we don't wash cars and you know, remove some stuff that he had concern about. The plumbing was already basically concrete put in there. So there's nothing that wasn't addressed right now yet. Okay, any other thoughts? No, I, li I like the idea of conditioning it because mm -hmm. I do feel like you're right. We are responding to the multiple uh, letters that we've received. And I think that that's a, 
However, <laughs> yeah, no, no. can I just ask that maybe you strike the um, fact that the it's referring to just the issue, it, the memo issued on November 26th, I think you said, and just say comply with any requirements of the health agent? Sure. Because so if obviously yeah, something comes well, up next week yeah. that is right. health agent related, that makes sense. Um, they would have to comply anyways, but right. we could just put that caveat in there. Great. So it'll be conditioned on any and all instructions from the health agent. Compliance with any and all instructions from right. the health agent. I'm writing this down too. <laughs> I think I got it, guys. Right, yeah. Awesome. Um, before we make a motion yes, tonight, I just please. wanted to say sort of three statements. Um, the first is, I just want to say, Mr. Sochenko, I really uh, appreciate how you've cleaned up the lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had multiple residents who had complained before about the lot come and say to me very clearly, it looks better, it is cleaner, it looks like it looks like a business that they want in stow. So I just wanted to relay that to you because I think that's a big deal that people are seeing the work you're putting in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, sounds good. I appreciate you guys noticing us. And I mean, like, we're glad to be here and we're glad that you guys, nice to, for you to work around. Yeah, so we appreciate that. The, the second thing is, is I really, um, and I was going to raise actually a similar condition and, and I appreciate Mr. Selby's uh, statements about it. I think this is exactly the way that I'd like to see us ensure that enforcement issues are part of our licenses. And if there are enforcement actions, health, building inspector, whatever that may be, like they need to be following that. If they're not, it should be relayed back to us through our town administrator. And then we as a board can reconsider the license at that time, mm -hmm. but we should be having enforcement actions occur where they should be occurring and not at this board because this board is not an enforcer. And so to me, I, I take that very seriously. And so I, I love that this is part of our licensing and maybe there's a way for us in the future to integrate this more as we're you know going through this process and, and learning from it. Uh, and the third thing is, is I do support uh, and will be voting in favor of the, the 80 cars uh, because I do see the conditions improving, um, albeit, you know, I still am, am hesitant, but I think that from what I've seen, I'm, I'm in favor of this with the condition because I do want to see a very successful business and still uh, move forward. So um, I just wanted to make sure I, I shared that with you. Anything else? All right, so I'll take a motion. You ready? Yes, Madam Chair. <laughs> I move to amend the class two license issued to car two car lot express at 92 Great Road units one and three, which currently allows five cars in the showroom, five cars in the garage, and 60 cars outside on the lot to allow 80 cars on the lot on the condition that car lot express comply with any and all requirements by the Board of Health or the health agent. Second. Does that cover everything? Yeah. All right. All in favor. All right. All right. All right. That's unanimous. All right. So You're all set, Alex. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Thank you, too. Thank you. I guess I'll have to write it off. Okay. Again. So, Alex, we'll have a new license um, drafted and signed off and, and get it to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, before yes. we leave this topic, may yep. I make one quick statement? Okay. In some of the correspondence we received about this license, there were statements made that surprised me that some residents thought that there had been an, a violation of the open meeting law um, and also that we had uh, acted against town council's advice. And I just wanted to note a couple of things. Number one, there was no violation of the open meeting law. And I'm unclear why so away from everything else, because that's the way they could put the, the stolen information in writing. Um, it may have been a quick discussion, but since we had so much information in writing and we were just doing the license renewal and kicking it for only three months, I'm not sure that it needed any more discussion than it got. Number two, my memory is that we acted in perfect compliance with what town council recommended. Um, and number three, and I may have already said this, there were no discussions that I'm aware of outside the room on that subject. It, it didn't need any, obviously, no, any would have been inappropriate, but that just didn't happen. And I just wanted to note that. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that.
Can I add yeah. some since we're on the topic? Yeah. Um, going forward, um, I'm inclined not to post correspondence from the board's agenda online any longer. Um, we will continue to post the packet, but I feel that the correspondence is being taken out of context. It's being used on a targeted attack and it's being used to grandstand. And we're being criticized when things are in the packet, when they're not in the packet, when they come late, when they get emailed to the board. Everything is a public document and folks can request it by Freedom of Information Act, but we're not gonna just be putting these things out anymore because it's not fair to my staff to be continually criticized that something's in there, not in there, past the deadline, before the deadline. It's just not happening. There's no legal requirement to post any of this online. Right. Um, I contemplated not putting the packet at all online, but I felt that that really wasn't appropriate. We'll start with removing the correspondence. It will all go to you all. You can read it here and people can request it. But um, what's been going on lately, in my opinion, is just not appropriate use of the board's agenda. Um, I think it's being used for personal reasons and that just shouldn't be happening. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, it's most of what we're getting. We've read it multiple times now. We really don't need more copies. Um, reformatting it doesn't change the content. We've gone through it, as Jim said. We've we've reviewed it all and, and have an opinion of town council and our town administrator. So um, appreciate if people would let that go and appreciate how much work there is to be done um, elsewhere in the town. So on that note, let's move on. Um, the Green Advisory Committee, Carolina is our designated uh, person on the committee and was gonna do a presentation for us and let us know what's been going on. Hi, Sharon. Yeah, so we're getting background noise from you. Checking out good pricing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Different sizes if we get very price sensitive. Just like Carolyn. All right, hi, Carol. Hi. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, first of all, I just want to apologize that we didn't get the handout in the packet um, for two reasons. One, we wanted to meet with a, a MAPC consultant uh, first. And the second was my naivete. <laughs> and uh, uh, I didn't realize that that there was this packet. And, and so uh, next time we'll make sure the handout's in the packet. So the question I have is, would you like, um, would it be possible to uh, to screen share and I can put a copy up online or do, okay. I think that have, you should have access. Okay, so let me open this up. And I believe I just hit share screen. Okay. All right, so this looks pretty long, um, but I'll just uh, whip through it. I, my goal is to just go give you the highlights and then um, it will have uh, time for uh, Arnie and Sharon to chime in too for a Q&A. So uh, the Green Advisory Committee has been meeting since October 7th. We meet on the first and third Thursdays between 7 and 9 p.m. We have uh, a three-month interim assignment of chair, vice chair, and clerk. Uh, and um, we'll be voting next in our next meeting uh, on permanent assignments. And so Arnie's the chair, Arnie Epstein, Sharon Brownfield's the vice chair, and I'm the clerk. Uh, I'm gonna run through key activities we've been doing just to give you a feel on how, how, uh, how much we've taken on in the past three months. Um, we have a, a group that's do, having ongoing meetings with other Stowe town committees and developers of Athens Lanes and Stowe Acres developments. The discussions are, are uh, they're having discussions and education about all electric housing, which also include introducing these developers to the developers at the Devon's uh, Green Housing Complex. And um, the initial reception has been very positive, although we have no guarantees that they will uh, build greenhouses, but um, we've um, had some positive reception on this idea. Uh, we have a, a group of members who are uh, having ongoing meetings with Hudson Light and Power. The goal is promoting all electric new housing developments, EV charging stations, solar and storage, and they're partnering with Green Hudson in this collaborative engagement um, and discussing with Hudson Light and Power the possibilities of uh, having incentives for each of these areas. 
And uh, this is another uh, discussion that has been positive and Hudson uh, Light and Power is um, interested in, in, you know, the exploration of, uh, of these areas of, uh, and of incentives. Um, so uh, several people have been working with various town departments. Um, one is the library building committee on the uh, heating uh, ventilation, air conditioning for the library renovation and, and talking to them about heat pumps. And um, three of us met with uh, police chief Solis regarding the most energy efficient vehicle to meet his requirements for new cruiser. And uh, one member is uh, working with the chief and submitting green communities grant request to help fund the vehicle. Um, the, uh, we recently, uh, our last meeting, we met with the MAP consultant, Jesse Way. Stowe has a $5,000 MAPC grant for aid with developing a scope for the climate action plan. And um, it starts with community engagement, town committees, group, town groups, schools, um, to, for us to meet with them to uh, understand that the town's uh, perception of a climate action plan and what they think is important. And uh, it's also going to include exploration of what items in the plan are going to require funding. and. Um, then what, what we'll be building, what Jesse's way is going to help us build is this scope, what is going to be included in this plan. Um, all team members are uh, working on investigating funding sources, state, federal, and, and other organizations. It's critical for encouraging existing homeowners and businesses to convert to all electric heating and hot water and electric vehicles. Um, and this includes an uh, investigation of uh, what other towns who are ahead of us in this process, what they uh, found discovered with funding or what they have received in terms of funding. Uh, uh, two of us are uh, also uh, reviewing other towns' climate action plans and the processes for creating those plans. Uh, we're looking at um, what, what they received with funding. As I mentioned, uh, we're looking into what they are using as metrics for success and what their challenges and successes have been. Uh, and we're currently working on uh, uh, reviewing and, and talking uh, to Acton and Concord because they're much further ahead in this process than we are. And uh, then we're going to start branching out and looking for some towns that are in this uh, process that are more similar to Stowe. Um, we have uh, made a tentative decision uh, to include adaptation and resilience in the climate action plan. And this will include the recommendations from the Stowe MVP assessment and support of Stowe natural lands. There are two topics we'd like to just give you a heads up on today um, and not go into in any depth because these are topics that we feel we need to bring to the select board uh, and really just talk, a, bring you a proposal and talk about that topic on its own at a specific time. So we'll need to make an appointment. One is we're considering asking the select board for a resolution on prohibiting fossil fuel in new municipal buildings. A lot of towns uh, in Metro West or across Massachusetts are doing that. By law, the town cannot force developers to build all electric residential or com commercial buildings, but we can control what they do for mun municipal buildings and construction. Um, members of the committee have already met with the planning department and they plan to meet with other town committees and then we'll put together a proposal and bring that to the select board. Uh, the last item is that uh, we know you're currently in the planning, um, planning of the budget process and we'd like to request that you hold a line item in the budget for the Green Advisory Committee. We don't have a number for you right now. We're hoping that um, at what, while working with Jesse Way, we can uh, understand uh, what number, what kind of number this involves, and then uh, drop a proposal for you and bring that to the select board as well. So I, I just wanted to add that um, uh, I'm really impressed with everybody on the Green Advisory Committee. This committee is charged up. Everybody really, really clear, cares about Stowe and climate change, and everybody has just stepped up amazing. and. Um, I think that uh, we're all charged up to make this happen. You've got an enormous amount done in a very short amount of time. It's, you know, <laughs> puts a lot of other committees to shame. So, um, so I, I have to agree with you. You guys are charged up. 
Um, I I guess well I'll ask the board questions or comments. I, I have a question or two, but I'll I'll let you guys go first. Oops. Um so one of my questions was just have you talked to SMOT about the Red Acre development in terms of that those buildings that will be built? Is that on your list? Arnie? Let me unmute Arnie. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> Uh, no, we have not started uh, discussions about the Red Acre development. I think you should, because <laughs> they're they're uh, they're moving along on that. Okay. Uh, I think I know that they've already talked about it within the committee, but I think having partners with that would be great. Um, any so really any questions or I guess I'll ask um, Arnie or Sharon if you wanna. Do you have any other things you want to add? Since, since Carol went through that so quickly, which is awesome. Thank you. No, I think that captures uh, the key activities that we've been involved in. Yeah. Okay. You all integrated in internal justice or thinking about, you know, cost to pay and in, in any of these, you know, next steps as you're, as you're working through. I imagine it's an overall theme, but we'd just like to hear a little more of how you're thinking about you know how we're going to get folks to to buy in and, and you know spend their money on on this worthy this worthy goal. Um, sure. Uh, any climate action plan uh, uh, has to have equity. You you have to think about equity and, and social justice in in the plan. Um, the biggest challenge, and this is a challenge for for every town, is is funding. Is how do we get incentives? Um, especially for people of low and moderate income to be able to afford this stuff. It's not cheap. And so that's one of the reasons we're actively, even, even now we're starting to look at funding options. And, uh, you know, many of us are, are speaking to our legislators at the state level. Uh, it's, it's, that's going to be one of the biggest challenges uh, of fighting climate change everywhere is funding. Um, so we're very, very aware of it, Zach, and, and um, uh, you know, this, this will, we'll be thinking about that through the entire climate action plan development. One other thing, Zach, uh, to mention is that in looking at other towns, um, I particularly know in Concord that they've done um, real, a lot of work with their um, utility to work on uh, apartment buildings and apartment complexes and multi-unit homes to be able to introduce things like charging stations and other energy efficiency measures um, and getting with their rebates, et, et cetera. So I think by exploring what other towns do, because I know all towns are having this type of issue and um, some may have been more successful than others and we can learn from that. Thank you. May I make one comment? Sure. Um, so I just want to let you know that I did um, communicate with John. So it, it would not be a line item in the budget. It would be an article, an article request. So you have until April 1st to submit your article request um, for funding for the Green Advisory Committee. Oh, great. Thank you. And I just, I was just looking to see if there's other people. I know Bob Collins is on your committee. He's on the call. Is anybody else? Um, just want to recognize the, the group that's working on this. Carol, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen, please? Sure. Um, <laughs> how do I do this? It's up top. Up top of your screen. Where it says share? Yeah, stop sharing. It should say no. stop sharing. No. Uh, no, no. No. If I can stop. Yeah, you might be able to. So can I just close this? down no no oh okay oh great <laughs> if anyone else would not uh, that screen sharing <laughs> um, thank so you if else wants to uh, comment please raise your hand well thank you so much for giving us the update um it's impressive and uh look forward to to hearing more what 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 that comes next so thank you all thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I think you're all fired up. <laughs> it's a good group. Okay. Um, so the next is a presentation from Don McPherson, Minuteman Airfield. 
I saw Don there with his cowboy hat on, <laughs> except for that's not probably what you're wearing right now. <laughs> oh, I, I was on live earlier. Uh, do you mind if I put the video back on? Yes, please do. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather not be wearing a hat indoors, especially a straw, <laughs> especially a straw hat in the winter. Um, I'd like to share my screen also. Can you help me do that? So if you click the green button at the bottom that says share screen, it then should ask you which window you want to share. There you go. Boom. All right. Uh, you can see it okay? Yeah. You can it. Okay, thanks. Um, it's nice to be back, even though we're not in person. Um, I met Denise this summer and I was shocked to find out um, I hadn't even been into the town building to meet new people. And it's this isn't as good as being in person, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm going to discuss two things tonight. One, I'm going to give you a, a brief recap of the effects uh, that COVID has had on the airport. Some are good, some are bad. And tell you about our exciting uh, pursuit of our state-funded administration building. And maybe I can make this go on to the next picture. Yep. So briefly, um, one of the impacts fell on the EAA chapter 196. This is the group, the pilot organization that uh, flies children for free. It's called the Young Eagles program. Uh, they canceled that program during COVID. Uh, this particular group is proud of the fact that they have flown more children than any other EAA chapter in the state. That's their focus and they excel at it. And we also had to cancel the uh, open house in 5k, which is also run by EAA chapter 196. Additionally, the Rotary and Lions and EAA sponsored Wings and Wheels program had to be canceled. A lot of people missed that. The cafe had to shut down. And when Nancy reopened, she did so only in, in the takeout. She was very concerned. Uh, this goes back two years now, very concerned about her staff and her customers relative to COVID. Uh, as the summer wore on, we uh, put up tents for her so people could sit outside. The operations office, little corner of the, the restaurant building is where we sell fuel. Um, the sales plummeted and we are still um, operating with reduced staff as a result of that. NAA, NAA is the North American Aviation uh, School. Uh, it was founded as East Coast Aerotech in 1932 and it's changed hands several times, and it used to be based at Hanscom Field, and they moved here five years ago. They're in the South Hangar. Uh, they train uh, aircraft technicians that come out with an FAA license to work on planes and other related kinds of equipment, such as transit equipment. They uh, were initially, uh, when COVID started, in the South Hangar and half of the Brown office building at the bottom of the parking lot, um, distancing was a real crisis for them. And uh, we managed to get them extra space in the North Hangar by moving stored aircraft from the North Hangar outside and airport equipment outside. So they were able to continue to run their school. Alakai is the hydrogen fuel cell powered urban mobility vehicle. Say that three times really fast. Uh, they were uh, initially in half of the South office building and one T hanger. And during COVID they grew and they expanded into three T hangers where they work on their, their vehicle. Later on, as I call it post COVID, I think I put some question marks there because I'm not sure it's post COVID yet. Um, <laughs> as things started to return a little bit more to normal, NAA uh, shrunk back down into their South hanger office complex miraculously just in time for Alakai to expand into the North Hangar as they were continuing to grow their research and development department. This forced me uh, out of the North Hangar. I still miss my nice little corner office. 
Um, and I'm now in a, what was a vacant dining room in the cafe. Uh, Aptus is the flight school. Uh, they were relocated from the North Hangar into the flight deck dining room. That's the, the dining room that faced the gas pumps and the runway. Um, the airport maintenance shop went outside and into storage containers. The airport archives, not a very sexy part of the airport, but we have archives and they've gone into storage containers. The cafe dry storage was in the North Hangar. They went into storage containers and Alakai has taken over the entire North Hangar. Uh, the cafe uh, is continuing with takeout, but only during uh, warm weather. Uh, they shut down for four months last winter. And uh, they have now, as of January 1st, shut down for four months this winter. The only glimmer of, of goodness in that situation is that Nancy's getting a well-earned vacation. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's leaving tomorrow, actually. Um, the young, um, as we started to come out of COVID, the Young Eagles program uh, resumed this summer uh, and fall. Um, and the open house and 5K went off again this year. We're very happy to see that happen. Um, the, the sad part is the cafe could use more space, but we don't have more space. Meanwhile, shifting over to the admin building program, the state in 2015, the State Department of Aeronautics developed a strategic master plan for airport administration buildings at airports that needed to have their buildings either created or renovated. Uh, it, it's similar in a, in a sense to the school building program. There are strong suggestions for using a standard design to keep costs down. And there's a, a, a list of program elements that are supposed to be in each of the buildings. Um, uh, we've been working over the past three years with Kate Hogan and Jamie Eldridge who support this program and have been helping us uh, move up the ladder in terms of funding for this project. This is uh, the architect's conceptual view of a standard building. It has uh, administrative offices spaces, hence the name admin building, uh, a community meeting space, which we're looking forward to having active again, and a uh, food service space, as well as uh, uh, accessible uh, restrooms and showers and pilot meeting spaces and so forth. That is a standard building, which Nancy and I thought was pretty abysmal. And the architect has assured us that uh, if we get our grant and get a building here, it won't look anything like this. And it would look more like Stowe um, in terms of reflecting our heritage with uh, open space and golf courses and apple orchards. Several of the buildings that have been built were modified from that standard design. In North Adams, seven airports that now have buildings, North Adams um, moved a building from down the street onto the airport. They uh, had a situation where they could buy the building and move it for less than money than building a new building. So theirs doesn't look anything like the standard. Fitchburg has a standard building. If you drive up there someday, you'll see it at the bottom of the hill going in. Beverly has uh, one, uh, GHG is Marshfield. Theirs is unique. They renovated an old barn, post and beam barn and added new high-tech elements to it. And it's a beautiful structure and very functional. Plymouth has, has one of the bigger buildings. They came in three sizes. Uh, theirs has a very active restaurant. Mansfield has one with a little restaurant and Southbridge has a new building. Taunton is currently under construction and PSF is Pittsfield, LWM Lawrence and 6B6 Stowe. Uh, we're the last three on the list. Now we've been pursuing this for some time and the program has started in 2015 and things have changed. Uh, the green committee was on just a minute ago and what's happened to our project is it has morphed into what we are now calling our net zero transportation infrastructure project. And there's interest at the state level um, to provide a three megawatt solar array here and power the new building sol solely with solar and some kind of backup, could be batteries, could be hydrogen. 
uh, and use geothermal pumps to heat and cool a building. So uh, I could talk for hours about that, but I won't. It is very exciting. And um, uh, the program elements wouldn't all fit into the admin building because of the limits we have here in terms of ground space. So we've also proposed uh, an annex, which would be on the street coming into the airport, and it would house parts of the uh, common elements that wouldn't fit into the, the main building. I'm going to show you a very exciting chart, which you may and may not be able to read. It's compiled from the uh, 2019 statewide airport economic impact study, which I think I may have reported to you on in 2019. And it's construction numbers, uh, which were given to me by the state and the feds. Um, is, is it legible on your end? Not really. I'll, I'll send you this entire thing so you can read it at your leisure. But uh, of the general aviation airports, and that means not Logan, not Worcester, not Hyannis, not Nantucket, of the general aviation airports, we rank number six in terms of economic impact. In terms, in terms of public investment in the airport, in the airports, we rank eighth. So we generate more bang for the buck than any of the other airports in the state in terms of investment and uh, economic impact. And that's the bottom scale there. We rank number one, which means that we, uh, state's investment here and in airport improvements have generated uh, a good return for the community. Uh, finally, uh, this project is important to us, partly because we're out of space, uh, I don't think I'm the only one that would like to see a facility built at the restaurant could um, reoccupy and do the things that Nancy has been so good at over the years. Certainly constructing the building will boost the economy. And if we are successful in our quest to make it a net zero building, it will nurture the environment. Um, I do have an ask here for you and I'm hoping that you would um, see your way clear to generate a letter of support for this project and uh, urge funding sooner rather than later because we are so desperate for space. And I'd be happy to take uh, your questions. Great. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Thank you. Don, you mentioned uh, an annex out on the street, since I know Boxborough Road rather well. Have you thought at all about um, the architecture out there where there's a kind of an antique farm across the street and um you know is there any way to to be in keeping with the the street architecture uh there is there is um we interviewed we nancy and i and my commissioners um three architects back when we started this pushing for this and we were just deathly afraid that they were the state was going to force that modern looking building here, which we didn't think we liked. And every architect said, oh no, that would be the wrong thing. And we finally decided that the architect to use is the one that the state recommended, no surprise there. And he was adamant about making it uh, compatible with our local environment. Uh, we might be able to get public input on that, in fact, to help uh, make sure that it is uh, fits in stone. Actually, uh, in terms uh, of the way the project will go, uh, we have already submitted a, a pre-application for the design build phase of the project. And that went into the to the state last February. I think we're coming up on a year. And that's the early part of the project before it goes out to bid for construction. And that's when we'd be happy to have input on what it should look like. Just want to clarify though, when you said it was across the street, that's that's on the street going into the airport, not on Boxborough Road. Is that right? You're right. In it. If I said across the street, I misspoke. It's it's on the side of the airport driveway. So it wouldn't be I mean, on the street. Right. Oh, no, it would be none of this is visible from Boxborough Road. It's it's all way inside the property here. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, thank you. 
Exciting. Just one comment. Yep. Um, I visited with Don recently at the airport and he gave me a little tour. And it is, he's got a lot going on there um, compared to what was going on there a few years ago. And I just want to say, in particular, the school and Alakai are far bigger than I realized from these meetings mm. and far more impressive. Um, wow. And, you know, I, I really like what's going on there. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have been able to get three of you up here and Denise, and I have yet to meet our two new selectmen, but I want to personally invite them to come up for a tour <laughs> as soon as they would like to and, uh, and show them around. And thanks for your comments, Jim. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, it's amazing that but Alakai is just it's fascinating. I mean, it was fascinating the first time we heard him here and then saw them at the open house and like, yeah. oh my God, you could spend all day with those guys. Yeah. So, but sorry. I don't know why. I thought it was five eggheads in one room. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a big thing. Yeah. It's yeah. a real thing. Yeah. So. And I will just say, I mean, Alakai, I mean, Don was great with the tour, but I mean, they would have spent all day with us. Yeah. They mm -hmm. want. They were excited about their products. They were excited to show us their technology. You know, we can only take pictures of certain things, but yeah. um, it was great. It was a great, you know, hour or two to be around. And, and I agree, the school, um, the amount of students, that what they're working on, it's very impressive. Yeah. So one of the things they did, uh, Courtney came by uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday? I think yesterday. And, and they have this new thing they do now. Uh, they have a, a little balcony around where they're working in the machines and they say how many how many of you guys are from WPI and they put their hands up and how many are from RIT and they put their hands up and then yeah. and they have this big competition about which school is best and then they say how many how many of you guys are from NAA National Aviation Academy how many got your AMP license here at the airport and another flurry of hands go up so there's great uh, wor workforce development things going on here they have 36 employees on the field now They'd like to have a hundred people here in two years. And we're trying to find ways to provide space for them separate from this administration building. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. For Alakai to be in snow, I mean, that's just, you know, talk about that's cool, you know, that they're here. So we're glad you got them here. And I think it speaks really well to, to what you're doing. So. Well, we, we are on the governor's road path to uh, net zero 2050. And we hope we're the first ones there. So, so there. Um, so I think I am, I'm perfectly willing to, uh, to make or have a motion made to, to draft a letter of support for your application. That was on the last slide, which is now not in front of us. So um, did anybody else take notes on what it says? I, I took a picture. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll send the whole uh, PowerPoint presentation to you also. Thank you. Um, so we we want to. Um, I was thinking we would direct you to to letter to write a letter on our behalf to support their application for the net zero dot 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 whatever. Happy to <laughs> name the project. So um, move. Any <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Second. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right, Don, you get a letter. Denise will do that for you. Terrific. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to uh, meeting uh, Megan and Zach soon. Hey, if I can bring the family. Sure. We've got some kids. We'd love to be there. Yes. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Excellent. I'll be there. Great. Good luck and uh, have a nice trip south. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Take, Take care. care. Take care. Bye. Bye, right, Don. Okay, let's see, where are we now? Um, oh, disposition of surplus goods from the highway department. Um, sorry, can you, yeah. you jump around? To no, other. that's all right. Um, let me just, in case you have questions, let me um, Steve. I just, when I saw the um, street sweeper, don't I remember that like major discussion at town meeting about getting our own street sweeper? Is this that same? One? Okay. I was going to go back probably to see how long ago that was. It was probably a long time ago, but I just remember it was heated. Like, why do we need our own? Oh, I, I forgot about that. Yeah. Street Troopers, nice on record. Very expensive. That's what I remember. <laughs> In any case, they can't last forever. So, no, no. 
It doesn't work. <laughs> Steve's ready to tell me how old it is. Okay. Um, yes, I have lots of pictures. We did not include them in your packet, but I have all the pictures if you'd like to see the, the worn equipment. Um, you know, it's just obviously equipment um, ages. It's not it's not safe to keep um, operating. And quite frankly, it costs too much to maintain um, once they're past their point. So um, Steve is unmuted. So if you have questions on it. Anybody have any specific questions around the, the items that are being retired on the process? Okay. Then um, I will uh, take a motion. I move to declare as surplus the goods and equipment on the list provided by the highway superintendent valued at less than $10,000 and belonging to the town and to authorize the disposal of these surplus items, the Timco street sweeper and the 20 KV single phase gasoline powered Onan generator with a Ford industrial products motor. Second, any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 That is unanimous. Okay, Steve, you're all set. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for keeping on top of the equipment. Um, now we move on to ARPA part two. Yes. Um, so the first one is just um, I'm requesting additional funding for the COVID response. Um, if you, I believe it was two weeks ago now. Um, few days before New Year's Eve, the governor announced that they were um, putting forward state contracts for municipalities to purchase at-home testing kits. Um, I went on at 6.30 the next morning and put an order in for us up to our capacity that we were allowed under the first allocation of COVID funds through ARPA. Uh, they have not come in yet. Um, when they do come in, we will work police, fire, council on aging, and myself will figure out um, who the vulnerable population will be to receive the first allotment. Um, but this will allow us to continue to purchase at-home tests, provide additional resources. Obviously, things are kicking up again. We need to, um, we're buying masks again, N95s for employees. Uh, we're back to buying, you know, uh, cleaning solutions, hand sanitizer. So this is just an additional allotment for COVID response only, um, just so that we have it as as the need arises. Yeah. Um, so I'd ask if you can allocate that, and then we'll get on to the um, the form that I put together for requests for ARPA funding, and we'll talk about that a little bit. All right. Madam Chair, I move to approve the request by the town administrator for $50,000 additional funding for COVID response. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. We talked about um, project funding guidelines, how we were going to handle that. Uh, a couple things. Um, last week, the U.S. Treasury changed. Once again, the ARPA allocation uses, um, it actually benefited us because um, it, it deals with that lost revenue category. Mm -hmm. So if you recall, um, we had $2.1 million in total, um, and it was about 1.7, 1.8 in lost revenue. They've decided that anything under 10 million can be used for lost revenue. So it, it would include our entire 2.16 million to be used for pretty much any purpose. Um, okay. We're still, you know, because we have money allocated for PFAS, we have money allocated for COVID. We still meet that criteria without, but it just gives us more flexibility. The same categories cannot be funded debt, um, stabilization, things like that. But it allows anything to all the funds to be used for really any municipal purpose. So that being said, I put together sort of basic guidelines that talks about um, the process. I tried to pick up what we talked about at the last meeting, um, that uh, requests need to be sort of owned by a department. They would need to sign off on the request to show that they will support the funding, maintain the funding, uh, work through the project or um, the purchase, whatever it may be. Um, I put in there that the board may convene a subcommittee because we hadn't decided that. I'm not even asking you to decide that at this point. I think if we can agree on guidelines in a form, we can get the process going and talk about how we vet those projects. I know folks are anxious to start submitting uh, requests. So I'd like to at least get this out and, and see what starts to come in. Mm -hmm. um, I talked about how um, obviously projects that are considered a capital asset will still have to be reviewed by capital planning. 
because we can't just bypass that. It would just be a different funding mechanism. Um, so if you have any questions on the guidelines, and then I put sort of a basic form together, obviously you can see with check boxes and then um, a narrative that they could fill out to provide some information on what their request is and uh, if there are ongoing costs associated with it and really what the ranking is. Do we need to do it today? Can we? Is it something that you want to get on the pipeline for next year? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have a lot of um, transportation and planning um, developments going on in town that you know, maybe there's something that the planning department says this would be great, but we don't need to fund it until you know next year. But I want to get it in there and approved. So that's all. These are all options for this, um, the guidelines and the form. So I'll turn it over if you guys have questions or want to make any changes to the process. I particularly like that you asked about ongoing maintenance costs because I think that's one of those things we forget. We buy something and then it still needs to be maintained. Yeah, so yeah. I thought that was. Uh, thoughtful inclusion and that was signed off my first question is like just so you say that you know right. oh yeah planning is going to take care of this does jesse know <laughs> you know so right seeing right. that signed off is good um so i it just seemed like a pretty comprehensive plan to me um other comments Please. Oh, no, I, only go had, ahead. I only had one uh, which was uh, i was just going to add and then denise i defer to you on this one you know really um but having you also be a signatory, so maybe it's the department or you, depending on sort of if you think it's across departments, you know, you could be the one to make that decision. I sort of like that. So if you have some projects up your sleeve that may require a rec and you know another <laughs> department that you could, you know, work across that and be the one to sign off on on all of it. So that way we're sure. facilitating uh, that process. Oh, I can add that. Um, yeah, this has been my most frustrating. Sorry, you don't have to look at what I don't have it. I do want to look at that. <laughs> Any other comments? No, I think no, I just I liked it. Well done. It seems like a yeah, fair and equitable well. way to disseminate <laughs> yeah. these funds right. for sure. Well, I didn't want to make a policy too cumbersome. I figured what you know, it's obviously it, it talks about what the purpose of the funding is, mm -hmm. um, and then gives some basic guidelines. Mm -hmm. And really the rest of it, it's your discretion. And now with um sort of the ARPA changes at the Treasury, it's almost fully at your discretion, even outside of categories. But right. it's still good to see if it fits into some of the basic categories that ARPA was. Um, put forward for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it seems like this would make it a really much easier process for us to have all that to that. A lot of key information right there. So. Yeah. I liked right. how you asked about the department that would oversee and maintain the project because mm -hmm. that's something we should always do with gifts, right. uh, which mm -hmm. is kind of is. But it would be too easy for somebody to come up with a great idea that, well, I'm not going to take care of that. I mean, that's, not, that's not coming out of my mind. Um, and that will ask them to sort of, you know, put it on the bottom line. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we don't have to vote on this. This is just well. I would ask you to vote on this. Oh, you did. Um, not necessarily on forming a subcommittee or how we're going to review them, oh, okay. but at least we can get it disseminated and get folks starting to talk about it, think about it, fill it out. Okay. Um, I, it's there's not a motion on that, oh. but we can we can wing that, can't we? I, I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> and we accept the guidelines and the form generated by the town administrator to um to <laughs> um accept uh requests for our funds second all in favor aye, aye. aye. that's unanimous great well done good job on black. thank Tom you black. All right, next uh, intermunicipal agreement extension for making connections. So this is from planning department. Yes. Um, let me just pull up, I had some info. Uh, so this is an extension of the sort of ghost stow taxi program. Um, it was supposed to be until the funds were used. They obviously haven't fully been used. I do have some statistics. Um, 
So to date, um, they have provided 56 trips. Um, one way equals one trip to a number of different residents. Um, the rides have been overwhelmingly used for access to medical appointments as far as Boston and Worcester. And since the program's inception, the pace has been steady as more riders have been qualified for service. Um, so they are just asking to um, sign the extension to go through June 30th, 2022, um, so we can continue to offer the program. That's great. I'm sorry, did you say the, the trips are one-way trips or a round trip? trip? No, so 56 trips, that's one way, so. So a round trip is trip. Yes. Well, it was like it's a, it's a no brainer to keep this going up. Let them yeah. play it out and see how it goes. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I will uh, take a motion. I move the board sign the interdependent agreement extension for the making connect making the connections program as presented by the planning department. Second. All in favor. Uh, okay. Yes. Unanimous. All right. Um, another library project. Fund. Yes, so the library uh, received a donation um, when the movie filming took place across the street and they utilized their some of their area. Um, the donation was made specifically to benefit the library uh, renovation project. Um, and so I'm asking the board to just open the donation account and accept the donation to be deposited for use of the renovation of the library. Okay. Um, just so you're aware, we are not going to be the entity collecting the donations on the larger fundraising efforts. Uh, the friends of the library are planning to do that, but then they will be turning the money over to us so that we can then expend it against the project. So the friends will be handling donations, acknowledgements, acceptance. They will be under their 501c3, and then we will, um, they will donate it then in turn to us. Okay. Any questions on this? Mm -mm. All right, mm -hmm. take a motion. I move to open a donation account for the Randall Library Renovation Project and accept a $1,000 donation from Charlestown Productions LLC to be deposited in said account. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And can I just, before we move on, um, Linda has asked, and I apologize if we can revote the town election, she'd like you to read the positions as part of your motion. I'm sure. The annual town election be held on Saturday, May 21st, 2022 at Center School 403 Great Road between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. The, position, the open positions are Board of Assessors, one three-year term, Board of Health, one three-year term, Moderator, one three-year term, Neshoba Regional School Committee, one three-year term, Planning Board, one five-year term, Randall Library Trustee, three three-year terms, Board of Selectmen, two three-year terms, Housing Authority, one unexpired five-year term expiring in 2024, and Housing Authority, one unexpired five-year term ending, uh, expiring in 2026. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Um, we're going to take the meeting minutes first um, before we get into the COVID policy. These are meeting minutes from December 14th. Do anybody have any changes or comments before that didn't get into the draft? No, I'm glad they were able to make sense of the litigation update because. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, I'll take a Found moment. to be excellent. Yes. <laughs> I move to accept the minutes, uh, the meeting minutes of December 14th, 2021 as drafted. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I just want to thank yes. Joyce and Denise for keeping us so up to date. So uh, I know. Yeah. And complete. Such a struggle for yes. such a long time. And it's gone away. So. It's all Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> and who knows what she does while she's watching our tapes. But, you know. Joyce and Phoebe for proofreading. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah, really great. Um, so we're going to, um, Zach is. Yes, I'm, I'm just going to say uh, we're moving to the COVID vaccine mandate policy. Um, as an employee at Moderna, I am not going to be taking part in this, and so I'll be recusing myself. Bye. 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 
And we thank you and Moderna for everything. We're back to work. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, so you to sign them. Yep, you, you can use my table. Great. Um, so, do you want to um, introduce this to me, or do we you want me to? I mean, I think, um, well, I can introduce it. You can introduce it. It doesn't, so we've been talking about this for a couple months now. Um, we plan to have the policy in December. We pushed it off. We continued to wait to see what was going to happen with the uh, OSHA mandate in the courts. Um, we are putting it forward, um, quite frankly, for the discussion of you know, the, the content of it, um, what it looks like and what the board's ultimate decision will be on this matter. Um, I will say the uh, Supreme, the US Supreme Court heard the arguments last Friday. Uh, Dolores got some feedback today that they're expecting a, um, a decision on Thursday of this week. Um, that being said, there's still question depending on who you ask on whether or not the OSHA mandate affects Massachusetts municipalities. Um, the last time I spoke with Mass Municipal Association, they have taken the position that we do fall under the mandate. Um, different attorneys say we do, or we need to have the Department of Labor here then accept the OSHA mandate because even though we are following OSHA standard, standards, we are not an OSHA state. Um, that being said, everything is telling us we should at least have conversations and discussions in case it happens. Um, there is some belief that because uh, the governor is pro-vaccine policy, obviously he implemented one for the executive employees, that should it pass the SJC and should they affirm it, um, it may quite frankly come down as a Massachusetts decision. Mm -hmm. So. We've talked about it. Uh, Dolores and I did our best to put a policy together um, to cover everything. Um, we reviewed all of the policies out there from other communities that have been approved thus far. Um, and they are all over the place. Uh, there are communities that are not allowing exemptions. There are communities that are not allowing any testing. Uh, we felt obviously the intention is not to lose employees. We wanted to give all opportunities for those who uh, wanted to remain unvaccinated. Um, and we can certainly talk about it. I will tell you, um, as far as my position, it, it's, it's a very difficult position. Um, you know, my job, Dolores's job, it's to keep the employees safe. Um, we have a number of employees that are immunocompromised. We have a number of employees that are, quite frankly, scared to come into the building every day. Um, you know, and how do we do our best to protect them? At the same time, how do we protect the employees that choose to not be vaccinated? We certainly don't want to lose employees. Um, that's not the goal. That's not the um, ultimate hope of this. We, we want to accommodate and still keep people as safe as possible. So um, this is the policy that, you know, we put together. Obviously, it's a draft for discussion. Um, there is, um, as uh, was mentioned, as Julie mentioned in public comment, um, there are a number of employees um, against the policy. I will tell you, we have 131 employees and 10%, 13 employees are not vaccinated. Um, and we have 10 that they're just, they're part-time, they're, they're not in the building, so we haven't collected vaccine information, so they could I believe, based on what I've heard from their respective department heads, they are vaccinated. We just haven't received that documentation. Um, as Julie mentioned, she has a petition with 29 people who have signed it. I haven't seen that, so um, I don't know, but that's what she has said. Um, so that's where we are. Um, as I said, we've talked about this in the meetings. We've talked about um, where we go from here with COVID. So. Um, as discussed, we provided a policy for your review. And Dolores is on and she is here. If um, we have questions for her, she really pulled. Um, much of this came from the state um, executive employee um, suit. Uh, we actually got the ruling from the courts and took most, met much of this um, based on what the courts had determined was 
illegal for employers to do in this pandemic. So um, we took it right out of court decisions. Um, we don't want to do anything that is obviously illegal and appropriate um, and wanted to make sure, like I said, is that we could cover all the employees by either a testing option or a vaccination option. The communities, there have been several communities that have done away with testing. They did start with a testing option and have done away with it um, for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, testing is very difficult right now to um, get. Um, lines, there are lines, you can't get appointments. So some of them have said it's too difficult for folks to get appointments for testing. And right now there is with the Omicron variant, you could test negative this morning and be positive by tonight. Um, and so employers, um, the city of Boston, um, Mayor Wu just talked about it this week that it's just too unreliable for her. Um, again, I feel that we are, it's an option that we, we would feel comfortable with knowing that it's still, there's still a mask requirement in the policy. Um, that testing and masking would keep the employees safe. So I will. Uh, so I thought maybe we just start with if people want to sort of share where they're generally at. There's lots of pieces of that we have options of approving parts of it tonight, or you know, based on on the sort of pending Supreme Court thing, whether it makes sense to to do it tonight or or wait till the next meeting. Um, but there are parts that we might. Be able to vote on something, but I think it would be helpful just to to have some general conversation about it. So I don't know who wants to start, but uh, I can start. Sure. Um, I think um, a. I appreciate that you um, have put all of this together. I think it is a very thorough. Um, I think it is a very comprehensive um, document. I do appreciate just a couple of things. I do appreciate that within this, it's not an all or nothing for employees who choose not to get vaccinated. There is an option for you to get tested. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, Denise is not saying, you know, it, you can't apply for an exemption. So there is that opportunity if you choose to do that. Um, so I appreciate that, not the all or nothing approach. I was watching Michelle Wu also this week and I did appreciate that she said they're trying to meet people where they're at. And, and I like that approach. And I do think that that's part of this. Um, I think that the, of all of this, the mask mandate is a hundred percent key um, to success within the building. And I, I would like us to be able to take a position on that tonight um, for sure. Even if we decide to punt the vaccine requirement down to that sort of, if you're asking where I'm falling, mm -hmm. I'd like to get a little bit more um, understanding of what's going to happen in the Supreme Court and what's happening kind of, I do think we're within one or two weeks of those bigger decisions that I think would inform my own decision about that. Um, but I do think within our rights right now and within our purview, um, I think the mask mandate is incredibly important um, for town employees. So. That's where I thought. Thank you. And if I can just add, um, so I did extrapolate out the face mask um, information in the policy that mm -hmm. if the board did not want to act on the vaccination policy, we could implement um, a more strict face covering policy um, that talks about, you know, who, where, when, and what the um, enforcement would be. Um, for folks who are not complying with the mask. So I would say that that would be an option for you all this evening okay. um, so that we can, uh, again, find, do everything we can possibly to keep the employees safe while they are here and employed by us. Um, yeah. Um, I have a question first about um, the testing part of it. And I understand that, that um, probably getting tests out in the world is, is pretty challenging right now, schedule-wise. Um, I, I think at one point, the fire department was offering testing for town employees. Would it would it make any sense to, uh, would that be possible to have testing for an unvaccinated um, staff member there or that? So my position on that would be no, because we pay for all those tests. And I don't think it would be our place to pay for an employee's 
um, test when they when they're not vaccinated. I think that if they want to stay unvaccinated, this is an option for them to be tested and continue to be employed. Um, but I, I think that would have to be their responsibility. Sure. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, generally, um, um, you know, I'm interested to see, as Megan said, where the larger decisions come down. Um, I'm comfortable with having um, <clears throat> I'm comfortable with a mask policy being implemented tonight as um, appropriate. Um, and I appreciate, I just wanted to say that I appreciate in drafting this policy that you, um, that there is whoever did it, <laughs> but um, that you carried, carried over uh, in the time for people to go and get a vaccine and it's necessary um, and, and give them paid time to, to accommodate the requirement. Um, that just makes a lot of sense to me. So I think that's most of what I get to say. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate all the work that you and Dolores put into it. It's very comprehensive. Um, I am probably the most open of all the, the opinions I've heard so far to the actual vaccine mandate. Um, and I will tell you why. Although I, I'm hearing, you know, I can live with a mask mandate too, but I have a comment on that. Um, number one, I'm kind of assuming that even if the SJC or the Supreme Court say that the OSHA mandate does not apply, that we as an employer can choose to have a policy. And from, from the beginning of when we started talking about this, that's where I've been coming from. Should we choose to do this? Um, as a matter of pure policy, employment policy, in this current mandate, or, or rather pandemic, I think this is a good idea as a pure theoretical policy matter. Um, I very much want to be able to tell members of the public, whenever we reopen this building and our employees, that there are no guarantees. You may get infected coming in here, but you can know that we have done everything that we can do to protect you. Um, I understand that some number of employees may leave as a result of it, Keep in mind that I used to be general counsel to a large institution. I come from an institutional perspective. I admit that. I don't think that any well-run employer can afford to not do something that is a good idea merely because an indeterminate number of employees may leave. You have to go the next step to weigh the benefits and the detriments. Um, in this particular case, with a worldwide pandemic, and asking people to do something to keep their job that they are perfectly capable of doing, in fact, it is a good idea for them to do it. That is the scientific and medical consensus. And I am governed by that. It isn't like we're imposing or would be imposing a physical fitness requirement or a test that not everybody's gonna pass. And that no matter, you know, somebody wants to keep their job just simply can't, they would be able to meet the requirements, but they wouldn't, as we saw in the letters that we got from a, a matter of personal belief, which means a choice, which I respect, but that's the trade-off. As an employer, I think we have this right. What I don't have a handle on is, I just said that I think it's a matter of pure policy, it's a good idea. You do have to test it against reality. Mm -hmm. The benefits and the detriments. How much good will it do? It will give people, we got letters from employees who are threatening to leave because of their personal beliefs. We didn't get letters from employees who I know exist who will feel quite comforted, um, who have small children, who are deathly afraid of infecting their children if they get it. I don't have a good handle on that. Um, you know, and if, if employees, a concentration of employees in a certain area leave and we happen to need that, and in this current economy, it's hard to replace people. I haven't heard the town administrator say either way on that. And maybe she doesn't know, but that's what I would have to hear. I would have to hear that from what we can tell, the benefits outweigh the detriments. Um, if we're not going to do this, 
and we're going to stick with something like our current mask policy. It has to have teeth. Absolutely. And by teeth, I mean the sincere and immediate possibility of termination. Not necessarily on first offense. I would leave that up to the managers and operations. But I think this board, as a matter of policy, would have to be clear mm -hmm. that that is most definitely a possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm more with you, Jim. I mean, I, you know, I, this isn't, um, as you said, it's, it's not like a, you know, an optional, you know, I don't know, presidential medal, you know, exercise award. It's, I mean, this is a, we're in a pandemic and, um, and it is our responsibility as the board to make sure that our employees and anybody who has to come into town building can feel as safe as they are anywhere else. I mean, you know, we all know that right now with Omicron, it's a little bit of a jump ball, but you know, there are things that we know make a difference and masks obviously, um, but but getting vaccinated um, to me is just, that's that's what we all need to do for each other. And it's not, it's nothing personal. I would be really sad if any one employee left, um, but you know, that's their personal decision. If it's more important for them to, to not get vaccinated, then, you know, I, I wish them well and I, you know, hope they don't get sick, <laughs> but um, I, I hear, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I'd be just as willing to pass this tonight as is waiting. I mean, I understand the, um, and Jim just said it really well, so I won't repeat it, but I, you know, um, I think regardless of how the, the OSHA requirement goes, we're still going to be here in two weeks saying, well, we still get to make a decision, um, you know, if, if it feels more comfortable to wait just to see what more, you know, what the governor says or what the, you know, what Massachusetts or what there is a state, the next step is, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. But um, again, just to reiterate, um, Jim, so it's like, yeah, teeth and the mask requirement. And I would say everybody, you know, I don't know what you've written, but I would say, you know, everybody, regardless of status in the building has to have a mask on. It just, it's just easier, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't, I know if you're in your private office, if someone has a private office, which are very few in this mm -hmm. building, you know. And I mean, like, I know I talked to the town clerk and they're alternating because there's no way that they're in a private office and yet both of them have kids at risk. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, I appreciate that they're making that work for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's what we all are trying to do for everybody, whether friends or family, you know, we're trying to keep everybody healthy. And uh, so, um, thank you both for putting this together and putting a lot of thought into it and not rushing into it. But um, that's, you know, I, that's sort of where I end up with. Um, and especially with the testing right now, I think um, it is less reliable. I mean, it's, it's, and that's, so I don't, I don't know if it, when you just finally say, I mean, I guess, you know, with the mayor saying like, it's just not worth putting it into there anymore. Maybe that's where we should go, but um it is what it is now. So, um, so it's certainly, I mean, I think we're both comfortable if, if we want to just stick with a mask requirement tonight and, and make that strict eligible. Yeah. So just so, a couple of comments on that. So um, to answer uh, Jim's question, yes, um, it is the employer's right to implement this regardless of what the SJC does. Um, they could, they could find on behalf of the, um, the suits that were brought um, against the policy, it does not matter. You have the right to implement it as a as an employment policy. Um, the The policy itself would require um, impact bargaining with our unions. Uh, we have reached out. Dolores reached out to the, all the unions to see if they wanted to schedule time to impact bargain. Uh, to my knowledge, she's heard from the police and the dispatchers union. Um, they'd like to discuss it. Um, so it could, you know, it could be. If the board wanted to approve it, it may not be implemented right away because we would have to go through that process. So, you know, it may have to change the dates um, based on um, those discussions. Um, I, we just got a copy of Natick's policy today. Um, they approved theirs in October and they just finalized um, and are hoping to implement it, I think, next week. So it took them a little while to go through the process. Obviously, they're much bigger. They have uh, much larger um, unions and number of employees. But um, just so you're aware of those are the two, um, some of the, the responses. Um, I will say, uh, Jim, to your comment about um, employees in a sort of certain department, um, 
so yes, I mean, you know, there are quite frankly, any employee that would leave would be an impact to us um, based on the current circumstances in the market, but whether or not we'd be able to find um, replacement employees, uh, what that looks like, how long those positions would be vacant. Um, there is one department that has a number of unvaccinated out of the 13 um, has, um, and when I say a number, I mean, we have small departments anyway. So, um, but having three or four employees in the same department could be detrimental. Um, so it, 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 again, that is a concern of losing employees and creating a hardship for um, the folks that choose to leave and the departments that have to figure out how to continue to conduct business in the interim. Do we know, I mean, not that it impacts us directly, but do we know what the school district policy is at this point? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I have to do this. Um, I, I got to put you on a spot. I, I think there is a huge operational impact here. Those are the benefits and the detriments I spoke of. Do you have a preference between the mandatory vaccination policy or mask mandate with teeth? It's it's that's very difficult. Um, do I have a do I think that the mandate the vaccination policy is the right thing to do? I do, but with a small operation, I don't know if we could handle the implications of what would happen. Um, I think I would like to see if we could um, start with a more significant. Um, mask policy. So, you know, the one that's implemented right now is just, it was my policy putting it out, mm -hmm. um, doesn't really have a backbone to it. This would at least allow us to have some, you know, progressive discipline. Um, I will tell you one of the, I, one of the issues that concerns me is um, a number of the employees that are not vaccinated tend to not adhere to the current mask policy. That's where I feel like mm -hmm. We need something more, you know, more significant to show that this is serious as a as a town. We take this serious as a board. You take that serious, um, you know. So so could we wait and see what happens with the SJC? See what happens at the local level. Um, again, you could decide to implement it either way. That is your right. Um, but at least if we could put the more significant um, policy in place, um, I will just say, Ellen, what we've done. The policy that I have currently is. If you are fully vaccinated and you're in your own office space, you're welcome to take off your mask if you're comfortable to do so. Um, but unvaccinated employees are supposed to wear it while they're in the building or in a vehicle with others. Um, and that was put, put back into place after Thanksgiving. Um, so I did mirror the policy to sort of follow those same guidelines, but then have some um, progressive discipline, including suspension and or termination. So I'll just pass this up. I mean, most yeah, of it, yeah. I just copy and pasted right from the, the full vaccination policy. I just added a little more, I'm sorry. Um, I just added a little more to it. So if you wanna look at it. Um. I have a procedural question. Thank you. Um, if we were to approve the vaccine mandate policy, um, there's talk of not being able to implement it immediately because of other um, processes that really need to proceed the implementation. So were we to approve that tonight, would it indicate that then it would have to be implemented? Well, so it, it can be implemented regardless. I mean, impact bargaining is we sit down, we discuss the impact. If at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's still the employer's right to implement policy, but we have to have those conversations and see what, uh, the unions feel is the impact of their members. Um, so we certainly could, you know, we could put it forward, <coughs> excuse me, have those conversations, but still say we're still planning to um, have it be fully in effect by March 31st, and that's our deadline. Um, so we have those conversations leading up to that deadline. But I would say if you're not, if you're not 100% sure, then I would say don't put it forward because I'm afraid that people would start quitting and 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 feel that they're backed into a corner if we're not mm -hmm. fully decided on moving forward with the policy. Thank you. 
And Dolores, I'm going to unmute you if you have anything you'd like to, since you're the one who worked on the policy. Um, if you would like to comment or add anything to our discussion. Um, the only thing I think, you know, going back to Jim asking some questions, we do have some employees who are immunocompromised who probably aren't willing to write a letter because they're very concerned about their privacy and their health issues becoming public. We also have a number of employees who either have children under the age of five who can't get vaccinated or are living with elderly parents or relatives who they're very concerned about bringing the virus home. I think we will probably have to continue accommodating people by letting them alternate days or not be in the office on days that unvaccinated people are in. Um, but I don't think we wanna see people leaving. Um, we have a pretty good team of employees and I'm hoping we can all work this out together. Also of interest is that I did listen to the Supreme Court arguments last Friday and I was surprised they didn't put a stay on it. So technically it went into effect yesterday. Now they are saying that there could be a decision Thursday or Friday. I do think that would be helpful to know which way we should be going. Other than that, you know, the concern is really what I'm hearing from employees. And I know I've heard from some of the folks who don't want the vaccine that um, they're terrified of vaccines, they have panic attacks, and others who just are against it for a variety of health reasons. Um, they don't trust it. It was developed too quickly. But, you know, we have to decide what's best for our community. Yes. Um, so I heard enough hesitation from the town administrator that she sort of, she, you did answer my benefits and detriments question. I wouldn't, I'm concluding with detriments are higher, or at least, no, I'm, I'm concluding that, that you don't know, but that you can't with confidence say the benefits are higher. Correct. Um, so that being the case, I'm fine with an augmented mask policy. I, I just want to say, I, I really don't want to do this, the, the wait and see for OSHA. Um, I kind of don't care about OSHA. We're, we're, you know, we're in charge, we and you are in charge of this workplace. Um, and we can set the term. One thing that employers in Massachusetts still can do mm -hmm. is set the basic terms and conditions of employment. Um, there, are, there are guardrails all over the place, but this doesn't run into any of them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if there are unvaccinated employees running around without masks on, which is a bit of a surprise to me, um, I, I would definitely like to send a message by taking some unmistakable action tonight. Mm -hmm. And an augmented mask policy would be, would meet that, that requirement. So it sounds like that's what, we're going to do tonight and so, yeah. you know if nothing else i mean it's not like we haven't been talking about this for several months but right i also i mean i don't want to i don't want us to just feel like we have to do it just because you know it's so so let's go ahead with um the fat face covering mass policy tonight and then have it on next meeting's agenda to have a further discussion and decide at that point if we want to move to the full vaccination can I just ask though, so of the policy that was put together, um, do you support what's in there? Um, that if I was on a call this afternoon with Department of Public Health and they're hearing that the CDC intends to change the term fully vaccinated to include boosters, only they're gonna call it up-to-date vaccines, I believe. So whatever you're eligible for at that point in time, you would be required to have. So if you're within if you're within the five months of having Pfizer, your second Pfizer or Moderna, you would not need to be boosted. If you're outside of that, you would be. And then with J&J, &J, it's I think it's two months out. Um, so we did include the caveat that if the CDC changes the guidance that boosters would be required, uh, we did include the testing option. Um, so just for us for next meeting, if, if, if you agree with those, we will keep them in there for further discussion. If you'd like to see something different, um, let us know and we can um, work on that. 
Well, I personally, I mean, I think the evidence is just saying, yeah, boosters are making sense. So I, I'm in favor of including that language. Um, I'm just double checking what the testing was, but. Um, so the testing was once every seven days um, and you're, provi you're required to provide the documentation before your next work day. That's for people who, who choose not to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Correct. And we have, um, Linda has her hand up if you oh. would like to entertain that. I could unmute her if you. Um, sure. Yeah, Linda. I want to thank you all for taking so much time and consideration on this topic. Um, I'm going to answer one of Jim's questions is I'm concerned because I don't, I want to protect myself. I'm fully vaccinated and boosted and under confidentiality, I don't know who necessarily my coworkers are who aren't vaccinated vaccinated. And I would be more apt to tend to stay away and not interact with them. But unless someone shares it with me, I don't necessarily know. So that is one of my concerns. And I, I do have elderly family members and I have young grandchildren that cannot be vaccinated. And I have underlying health conditions that concern me. And if I contract the COVID, even, um, you know, that I'm vaccinated, that loss of time in my office is critical. And um, Debbie and I are not in the office at the same time so that we will have a continuity of our office being able to work. So I just wanna say that there's a detriment too if those of us who are vaccinated um, are exposed um, more often. So, that's where I'm going to end it now, but thank you so much for taking the time to do all of this and all the research. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, Julie. Yeah, Julie. I, just wanted, I just wanted to say that it's been proven that people that are vaccinated can get and spread the disease. So if you were to get it, it would not necessarily be from an unvaccinated person. And I think that you're unfairly saying that it would be and discriminating against those people. Um, also with the testing, I mean, again, people who are vaccinated and boosted can still get and spread the disease. So therefore, why should they not be tested in order to come into the building? When you manage risk, you don't just manage possibilities, you manage likelihoods. And it is without a doubt, that people who are not vaccinated are themselves at more risk, both of health consequences and of transmission. Okay, and that's their decision not to get vaccinated. They could have other ways of fighting diseases. As you said, some of us could be in better fitness shape and that's a way to fight against this disease. Just because we don't have comorbidities doesn't mean we should inject ourselves with this vaccine that we don't know could have adverse effects on us. What happens if you make us get the vaccine and we have some adverse reaction to that? What are you going to do for us? Well, no, Julie, you're, we're also not saying that you have to get it right. because we are, we would be providing for an alternative and that's testing. I mean, it's, it's not, we're not saying you have to get the shot or you lose your job. There is, it's not all or nothing. You, there is something in that mandate policy that provides for it. So you're I don't then discriminating it. against us by making us get tested when other people who are vaccinated could still bring in the disease. Well, Why aren't no, they getting tested? There's no testing requirement in this face mask, face covering. Correct. So right. Face covering, right. correct. Pardon? Correct. There was no testing in the face in the face covering policy. I was talking about the vaccine policy. Yeah. So I mean, right now, I think we're sort of leaning toward the face covering policy. Right. I will tell you. I mean, there are communities. Arlington is a. Um, if they, their their policy is if you're unvaccinated, you have to be tested every week. That's part of their requirements for whether any you know that's been in place without a vaccine mandate um, for months now that you test if you're unvaccinated. Period. Um, 
and you wear your face covering and you do other things. So uh, communities are doing all sorts of things to uh, mitigate this. As I mentioned earlier, there's no standard answer that works. Um, there has nothing, there has been nothing uh, decided in the courts that anything being done as part of a vaccine or mask mandate is discriminatory. Um, the courts have, have taken up a number of cases in Massachusetts now on the same topic, and there have been no, um, that has not been the case. It is the employer's right to um, implement policy. Again, there, there doesn't need to be a testing option. Many communities haven't even put that in place. So right. um, It may be a form of discrimination, but a form of permissible discrimination. <laughs> Certain kinds of discrimination are okay. It's just discrimination legal bases is not okay um and I you thought know, everything was supposed to be equitable <laughs> can make personal decisions but those personal decisions may have consequences and one of those consequences may be that your decision is inconsistent with the needs of your employer um so we have more people who have more employees that um, are they? I mean, I I feel like if we've opened the door to some employees, we should let them. So, so I'm gonna Stuart. Ask, I, I asked Debbie to. She was the first one to oh. open. Hi, Debbie. Go ahead. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm not really even sure where to begin, except to say, while I think the uh, mask mandate is a wonderful thing, and place since Thanksgiving. It has not been enforced. I sit in an office with a person who's not vaccinated and refuses to properly wear a mask. And in fact, the mask that this person chooses to wear is called the unmask. It is a two ply share curtain underlining with a fishnet outer line. And in fact, if you go on the website, it will tell you that this would not pass scrutiny for an airline or for school. So moving forward, just the mask mandate, which is what we've had in place all along, I'm wondering how it will be enforced as we move forward because it hasn't been enforced to date. So I think the difference here is that um, before it was the town administrator's guidance, and now as the select board, if we vote on it, it's a policy of the of the town that has teeth, as it as it were. Specifically, and, and who, who enforces that? Who is someone going around and checking to make sure that everybody has their mask on that needs to have it on? Is it is it on me to sort of to to be the and that has to go up to either Dolores or to Denise and say, yep, we still have a problem. It, am I the enforcer or is there someone from the town who's basically going to check to make sure in, that in fact masks are worn? And, and I just, sorry, I, yeah. So in any work environment, I think that when you have an HR department, if you are having issues with another employee, it is the onus is on the employee to report that to the um, supervisor, and then the supervisor can have the conversation with the other employee based on that. And I think that I I, I think Denise is not going to walk around knocking on everyone's door. I mean, that's like a would be a huge waste of her time. And B, um, I do think that conversations will be had. I think what, what this policy to me is allowing for supervisors in the town building to be able to comfortably have these conversations with their employees, knowing that they have the backing of the select board and this policy that their employees need to follow. But the policy isn't any different, really, than what has Already. Cool. Debbie, Debbie, can I, I actually think that there is a different message being sent tonight. I, I think, okay. I think Denise already pointed out that 
and I'm, I don't mean to put words in her mouth, but that you know, she was somewhat dissatisfied with the fact that some unvaccinated people were walking around with poor face masks. And what this board is saying is that we're behind you on putting teeth into that. And then she'll be in charge of implementing that. And as, as Megan just said, and I, I hate to get even close to operations, but as Megan just said, you know, there aren't going to be any mask police, but the first stop would be to your supervisor. And then I'm assuming, and Denise can correct me if I'm wrong, but just like with any other problem, if you don't get satisfaction there, you can always go to Dolores. Okay, but this this conversation tonight, assuming we go with this face mask policy, is meant to be a bit of a change. Uh, my, my, yes, I have spoken both to my supervisor and to Dolores. Right, so, but but so that's right. Right. without this policy, there was only so much they could do. So this so, this specifically states enforcement of um, employees who do not follow the face covering requirements will be disciplined in accordance with the progressive discipline steps outlined in the personnel bylaw or respective collective bargaining agreement up to and including unpaid suspension and or termination. That wasn't that wasn't an option from what I understand previously. So um, we have another employee who wanted to speak. So I'm going to ask um, Stuart. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, we got you. Yep. You can. Okay. So I, I, there are three things I would say. I only had two, but now I've got a third. So in response to Debbie, I provided a letter to the Board of Health a very long time ago and to my boss to indicate that I have a breathing issue. And if I wear a mask that is substantial for any length of time, I, I suffer significantly with my breathing, which is why I had bought these masks that I don't go on planes, so it doesn't matter that it's not usable on a plane. But I gave one of them to Dolores, and she has never come back and told me I can't wear it. It allows me at least to have a mask on. And I personally, by the way, think masks are a complete waste of time, but that's another completely different story. But I do wear it, and, and I find even that to be difficult with my breathing issue so you have not allowed for any medical condition in in the wearing of masks so that's my first problem my second problem is you say that there would be weekly testing which is fine but to get weekly testing i have to either have a medical exemption where i have to tell you all about my medical history that is none of your business or I have to give you all my information about my church affiliations, which is absolutely none of your business. I personally believe that the vaccine is a violation and abomination in the sight of God. And that should be enough for you to accept that I have a religious exemption to this and then go ahead with the weekly testing. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, I'll just read one section of this policy, Stuart, just so you know. Employees who have documented medical concerns regarding the wearing of a face covering will be required to work with the assistant town administrator, HR director, to make alternative arrangements that will keep all employees safe. So it actually is addressed in this policy. Okay. That's part of it. I'll leave the other ones. But so, right. So that's why I'm reading it. So, so they can see that. Um, so I think we should move ahead with the um if people are still comfortable with the face covering mask policy um and then i you know i mean it just seems like if nothing else give ourselves two more weeks to think through the rest of it yeah. that is that what everybody's comfortable doing now yeah i mean i'd like to um i'm assuming we're probably not going to enact the face mask policy now and then two weeks from now enact the vaccine policy. Um, I see what you're saying. But I would sort of like, whether it's two weeks from now or it's two meetings from now, an update 
on how the enforcement on just how it's going. Mm -hmm. uh, I just I feel like this is a first line of defense. Right. But if they can't do their if 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 it I will say this for myself. If it becomes cumbersome for the town administrator and Dolores to do their jobs because they're constantly policing this, mm. then I think we have to talk about a vaccine mandate. Right. Because we're giving people options here. We're even giving people options in the vaccine mandate. Um, or in the yes, in the yeah. vaccine mandate. Um again, not an all or nothing, but I think I would feel the most comfortable. You've got this first line of defense. Everybody knows what, you know, everyone needs to buy into this. And if you don't buy into it, then there's going to be consequences to it. I would love to hear in two weeks how it's going. And then I think I would love to revisit it at that point. Right. Um, personally, that's my two cents. Right. Yeah, because I don't want to, I don't want to presume we wouldn't come back in two weeks and work on a vaccine policy. I, I agree with that, too. Okay. So, um, we need a motion. So. Yeah, we need a motion. On, I think there was, a, yeah. there was a separate motion. I move to approve the mask mandate policy as discussed this evening. So. Second. Yeah. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The four of us unanimous. Fantastic. Um, okay. Um, um, we have. Uh, correspondence uh, one thing i didn't know where to just throw it in the sort of i didn't send it the district agreement um is i was going to mention it under town meeting business so i was i we appointed me to be on the this um regional school district agreement revision subcommittee advisory committee um i only sort of in the last meeting was that oh yeah you can actually let the board see the traps because it was it's been a little confusing, so um, I will get it out now. It's I actually Denise and I had a long conversation about it, and um, now it's in a form that I think it's worth looking at. So I will distribute that before the next meeting. The plan is to bring it to they want to bring it to all three towns um, this spring for because we're behind on updating it. It's pretty out of date. So, um, so that's that's one correspondence that will be <laughs> so. Um, the only other thing I wanted to comment on the correspondence was um, in terms of the bonding request, um, Courtney, that um, I did talk to Vin and, and asked him sort of what their time frame was in terms of um, recommendations. So um, he said, you know, they're planning on, they're getting um, presentations at their January meetings. They're making the recommendations on the, the first and second week in February. And then um, he will plan on coming to a subsequent board meeting here to discuss their recommendations, including um, if they are recommending bonding. So we can talk about that. It felt like we can't really talk. It's not our job to tell CDC anything. So if they propose bonding, then we can have that conversation. So I just want to okay. respond to that great. part of the response. Great. Yes. I have two things. One, um, this is a great email from this lady, Lucia. Lucia. Yes. Uh, I would say there's some money coming in. If you want to work with a department to, to do that and buy that gas station and you know, work with multiple different committees to try and do something, then I would say that's that's a start. So, um, and then I would be remiss, we did receive, it's not in the packet, we received a lot of correspondence um, from NASJA, and I did want to just address um, some questions to put on our agenda for the next time, and I just wanted to ask you publicly about that. Mm -hmm. um, it, one of them was talking about um, Black History Month in February, and I believe that Denise is starting to work on some things with that um, and with the idea that it would be on our next agenda um, to talk about. Um, with that, I know we had also briefly mentioned the idea of different months and tying them with different ones. What I would love us to be able to do is look at a calendar, like a, a year-long calendar, and just sort of I know what we're thinking about us. If it's not out there publicly, what the work is that's being done, that we're looking at addressing different months and, and talking about different issues, again, it's just as being as transparent as possible. And so I don't want people to think that we're not talking about this or we're not thinking about it. Um, and really, I would also like to point out that 
a lot of what we have been doing as a board is, is quite frankly, addressing equity issues through policy. And I'm really proud of a lot of the work that we've done with the police chief. Um, I'm really proud of um, some of the great discussions that are happening about housing equity. Um, and so I don't wanna lose sight of those bigger picture things that we're doing. But at the same time, I have said to a couple of different people, we don't have a mayor in this town. So we don't have the mayor that's sort of like, this is that. And, and even though we are the policymakers in town, and that's like our elected position, we also sort of are the de facto, like, we do need to make some of these statements. And so I think as a board, it would be nice to just be able to have that discussion about how we want to, or don't want to do that. But I think that it would just be helpful to sort of tamp down some of the divisiveness that's that's out there right now. So um, that's my two cents on on that. But I, I didn't want to I didn't want to yep, not mention that to me. We had said we were going to do a policy on on those things. Right, right. And so I know, and also we have like twenty things on the agenda tonight. Like I just I know, but but I mean that was last year. We were going to then right, right, without getting into a substantive yeah. conversation. Could I just make a comment? Um, I was thinking after I read all of these emails that um, maybe there were a couple of ways to break it out just for future, you know, conversations. Um, it seems to me that our town administrator is very aware of certain kinds of things and she um, works with our social media presence all the time or with a PR um, firm. And it might be a very logical way to, to um, to uh, empower her to speak to a comment, you know, whatever the let's say flavor of the month, although it may not be the appropriate thing to say, but what, you know, whatever the appropriate uh, holiday or, or um, monthly awareness is. Um, I personally think it would be really helpful. I'm imagining it would be helpful to the select board and to the to the administrator's office if we got information in a timely manner timed with our meetings about events that we could that we could speak to in our recognitions that's part of the reason we put it there i mean we can recognize whatever that's what that's for is kind of a generic term and if we were um told ahead of time, you know, a week or so ahead of time, and it just slides right into that slot and it becomes, you know, we're a machine. We're we're happy and willing to. Yep. Hold on. I'm going to ask Denise and then. Yeah, I just want to provide. So, yeah, so many months ago, I formed an internal committee of diversity, awareness, and inclusion. We meet, uh, we're actually meeting tomorrow to finalize our planning for Black History Month to recognize it. Uh, we work uh, we have the Council on Aging, we have our social worker, we have the library, we have police. Um, Dolores and I are on there. We talk about what we should do, what we can do as a community. Um, so I, I just want to say just, so there may be two issues, I think. Um, one is, you know, what we choose to do between the departments that will be social, put on social media and publicized. And then there's, you know, what position the board chooses to take, if any, on these same um, topics. Um, I think, you know, I will, I reached out to NASJA months ago and asked them for a list of the months that they recognize so we could incorporate them in. I heard back this weekend. Um, so we, you know, I, we wanted that, we wanted to incorporate that, that into our discussion so we could, as a community, sort of, so focus on the same things. That being said, um, Every month has many designations. Um, and we as a sort of internal committee have decided that, you know, while it's absolutely worthy to recognize every single one of them, we don't have the bandwidth as a small community and small departments to recognize everything. And that's why I've sort of named the committee the way I have, because we kicked it off with Breast Cancer Awareness Month, because it's, it's an awareness that affects a lot of people. It may not be a diverse topic, it may not be a recognition, but it still covers a wide variety of our community. Um, so we may have, you know, we actually joked about, um, and I think we talked about it here, that, um, you know, possibly in the summer we'll have bike safety week or, you know, the, and the police can give out coupons for ice cream for kids that are wearing helmets. And, you know, again, that's not a diversity 
but it's still getting out into the community and, and reaching folks. So we do plan to focus on some key months that have uh, significant diverse perspectives. But that being said, we can't do that every month because we just don't have that ability. Um, so we do have a program planned. Um, actually, Allison's working on some great things for her newsletter to incorporate. And like I said, we will pull it all together, hopefully tomorrow, um, and have something ready for February. And then we, I plan to bring it to you all anyways, to let you know on the next meeting what we were going to be taking care of. So just so you're all aware. Thank you. Just one little thing, sort of falls into the heading of a possible agenda item. Um, I think I'm going, I've been thinking about this for a couple of days. I'm going to draft an alternative statement to the one that Nasir floated to us because I felt that they made a valid point in a very off-putting way. I, I, I had to parse through the off-puttingness to get to the valid point, but I got there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna share it with the town administrator because it's going to incorporate, a, and you know my theme on this, a statement isn't enough. You have to actually do something, mm -hmm. probably something along the lines of education. It's gonna incorporate what her committee is doing. So I want to run it by her first. And frankly, depending on her feedback to me, I may or may not ask you to put it on the agenda for two weeks from now. That's, I mean, I, cause I was, you know, when I, this came up and, and you know, Denise and I talked about it, like we had said, you know, after the sort of, you know, the, the awkwardness around gay pride last month, uh, last year, you know, we said, well, we really need to sort of decide where this, where it goes, just what you just said. I mean, it's, you know, there's lots of months, everybody has their their sort of thing that they feel like we need to be recognizing. So, um, I and I too don't like to, the idea that we're just gonna make proclamations because I just, it drives me crazy. That's what politicians do and then they don't do anything. So, you know, when it's in context of the library's got a program, this council on agents got a program. Um, and, and I particularly that it's awareness. It's not just like whatever the, you know, flavor of the month, you know, right. is, I mean, there, there's a lot of issues that people feel really strongly about. And I'd rather, you know, I'd like to see us, and, and I sort of was, I wasn't sure I was going to get this by next meeting, but, you know, sort of start drafting that policy that we probably should have done it a year ago about like, what's our sort of standard on what we're going to do for, for whatever months or whatever awareness topics that come up, you know, are we going to, you know, because I'm fine with doing a proclamation if it's in a context of, well, we're also going to coordinate with, you know, boards in town or other organizations or something. Um, but, you know, because I don't want it to be fluff. And I do think we very easily can do that. I mean, yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I think it's an easy ask. It's just, it just needs to happen that yeah. way. Yeah. And, and I, I would just like to say, I would, I would appreciate, um, if then in turn the community or members of the community do not criticize us for the months we have not recognized yes. as part of programming and things, because again, we have limited resources, we have limited staff, we have limited, so if there's a month we miss, if we choose to recognize breast cancer awareness again, instead of whatever other month October is, again, just work with us, reach out to us, but we're trying, we're trying to implement something, we're trying to get it started, um, and you know, it, I would appreciate more, um, people sort of embracing what we're doing and then we can continue to grow with it as, as it goes along. But, um, you know, that's sort of what happened last year is we were criticized right off the bat that we didn't recognize the next month as something more significant. And like I said, every month is something and it, it's just, it, it's, it's too much for us to pull something like, like, like what we're planning for February off every month right yeah. well and to court, what courtney said it's you know there's if there's groups in town that want to do something for a particular month let us know and we are happy to you know for whoever's watching these meetings you know we, we will help publicize it because it's it shouldn't it's not just the five six of us that are going to do this stuff i mean it's the community wants to do it and, and if we're the only one doing it then it means even less so so hopefully people will yes to be bringing it in so i also have another yeah. comment just to, it, i kind of feel as though by making, I mean, I know that we are the elected officials that represent the town. Um, and I know that we're five white people, six white people in a row. Mm -hmm. And by, it makes me uncomfortable to proclaim something that I know is not 100% of the opinion of, of the audience. Um, because I don't want somebody putting words in my mouth. 
and I don't want to put words in the mouth of somebody that disagrees with, you know, what we're saying. So there are, there are certain things that I think it's really important to recognize and, and do it in a way that includes the conversations. We have two people who work in an office that just said to us, well, I feel this way and I feel this way. We're having trouble with each other. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's how life really is is that there are lots of points of view. So that's part of my dilemma is, is um, how to have every point of view proclaimed with fill our airwaves. <laughs> our, our building yes. commissioner just texted me that May is building safety month. So <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> thank you for answering. Yeah, thank thank you for right. every single right now. I do think we should wait till Zach comes back, though, to yeah. also oh, have more of a discussion. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. No, I just, no, I just didn't have it. I'm just commenting on the uh, Just commenting on correspondence. Commenting on the correspondence. So, um, yeah. So, you know, whether it's next next meeting or the week after. I mean, I think certainly there's things you can tell us around what's already being planned for Black History Month. Mm-hmm. And I think in the next month, you and I can work on a policy that's whether it's over, you know, over umbrella one or something specific i'm going to work on a statement i'll cc you a statement okay um for black history club um okay i've always thought that one in particular is a real opportunity you know, yeah. well for, especially with stoicers like i mean there's well, right. yeah, there's and, some real history that happened in this town yeah and, but for those of us who were educated in the public schools in the 60s and 70s there's a lot we didn't learn mm. and black history <laughs> month has always been a, a big opportunity um, <laughs> so yeah yeah. yeah, great. May is also National Town Clerk Month, by the way. Oh my god. Oh, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're, 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 we're rolling in. It's gonna be like the, what happens. It's gonna be like the ARPA money. Oh well, we can do this. We yeah. can do this. <laughs> so All right. On that note, I believe that is the end of our agenda. Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you all. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, and um, have a good have a good week. There's lots of